This week marks School Board Recognition Week, a movement to honor school board members statewide. Without a doubt, our district has one of the best boards of education in New York. Their dedication to the education of our students and to the greater community is unparalleled. Thank you all for each and every one of you for your tireless efforts. At this time, I'd like to present some certificates of recognition to all of you on behalf of a grateful community. Yeah, um, so as you can tell, this is my first time ever at a board meeting. Um, okay, so hello, my name is Lexi Richmond. I'm a senior at FM High School. Today I'm here to talk about the mental health situation. I have read and researched many articles and read many emails from both Syracuse.com and the email and updates from Dr. Tice. Now I'm not here to criticize what's, what he's doing <laughs> what he is doing and choosing to do, but I'm here to voice my opinion on what is going on. I feel our counselors are not supportive when we are dealing with a major anxiety attack or something along that line. Based on personal experience, I do not feel that the counselors are equipped to deal with psychological problems like anxiety and major depression at school. If we go to the counselors for that, they will contact our parents, of course, but in the moment I feel that they can't help us. Dr. Tice also said that we have 25 highly qualified psychologists and counselors and social workers on staff. He mentions our counselors and putting that pressure on them to deal with major problems within the student body is not that fair. Another topic I would like to bring up is if we had a mental health clinic that the school will not get the information shared between the student and the psychologist. Dr. Tice says, because the clinic would operate separately from the school district, patient information would be confidential and not shared with district psychologists, counselors, administrators, administrators, and teachers unless authorized by parental consent. Why does the school need to know what's going on with the students when they see that person in the clinic? It's just like if you're going to a regular therapist, they don't disclose that information that you share with your parents unless the patient asks so. If we had a mental clinic with trained professionals, the students and I would have a safe place to go where we know we are having confidential conversations with professionals trained for this matter. I feel our counselors are great with guiding us in our future experience, such as college, but I do not feel that they are adept with dealing with adolescent issues, including depression and anxiety. If we can get this mental health clinic established, I feel that students would be better supported with issues such as anxiety, depression, peer pressure, etc. Thank you for listening, and I hope we can come up with a resolution that is better for the students and school. Thank you.
Thank you. Hi there. Hello to Superintendent Tice and to the members of the board. My name is Marisa Della Garza. I'm here today to voice my support of your efforts to implement diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, in light of the recent conversations about the district's decisions regarding mental health services, I would like to specifically comment about the intersection of DEI and mental health. I am both a K through 12 FM alum, as well as the parent of two FM students at Fayel and Wellwood. My parents are 43 year residents of Manlius and raised five children here, all graduating from FM with an excellent education and with opportunities to participate in sports, music, and the arts. What I was not prepared for after growing up in our still predominantly white community was how to navigate the diverse cultures and communities I would later find myself in. But that was more than 25 years ago, a lifetime. I had hoped that when I convinced my wife, Kate, to move back to this area in order to raise our children, that things would have changed. In some ways, they clearly, clearly have not. After reading the many stories on the Instagram account, hashtag FM Truce last summer, I see that there continues to be ongoing harm and injustices occurring to BIPOC, female, LGBTQIA plus students and others, and others in marginalized groups. The traumas perpetrated by their fellow students and sometimes school staff members can and does have a serious impact on the mental health of students in these groups as well as every other member of the FM school community. As a clinical social worker working with children and adolescents for almost 20 years and being a school-based clinician uh, for part of that time, I've seen firsthand how living with a marginalized identity can cause chronic stress, anxiety, and depression and negatively affect student achievement. How can a student focus on their learning and be successful if they don't feel safe in the classroom, if they don't feel like they belong, if they must deal with daily microaggressions, if they don't see any teachers or staff that look like them, if parts of their culture's history are erased or misrepresented, if there's no consistent framework or support for discussing issues of race and identity in the classroom, if they don't feel like they have one safe adult to talk to at school, Addressing DEI issues and implementing policies that serve both to prevent harm and increase understanding will directly have a positive impact on the emotional well-being of all students. I appreciate Superintendent Tice's uh, email about FM contracting with a local mental health therapist to provide counseling off-site for students. I would like to ask him and the board to consider the benefits of having a wellness center or clinic located on-site in the plans for the future high school renovation. Removing the barriers to accessing mental health services can be life-saving for many students, particularly those that are the most vulnerable. My hope for my two children and for every FM student is that they can thrive in a school environment where their multiple cultural identities are affirmed and where their social emotional well-being is given the same amount of attention and care as their academic success. Thanks for listening. Hello. Hey. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Here, Dan. Um, my name is Betsy Hartnett, and I'm here to speak in support of the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. I'm both a parent and an alumna of FM schools. I just want to also add in that I support Lexi and Marissa both as for the mental health. I think that is a huge piece too, and I'm hoping that we can get a place for our students to go when they're having um, a mental health attack. The DEI initiatives benefit all of our students and our community. FM needs to stay strong against the opposition, which, although small, is loud and belligerent and often ignorant. In fact, the opposition doesn't even have an argument. They are simply opposition. There's a trend across New York State and the nation to challenge instructional materials in the library and in the classrooms. The people bringing these challenges have been fed information from the internet on what materials to challenge and how to challenge them and even what to write or say. 
Often these challengers have little to no knowledge of the content to which they are challenging, or even if the materials are actually in the schools. It's insane. So I am asking for FM to be a role model for what districts can and should do by fighting for what is right and what is best for our students and taking a strong stance against the opposition and supporting the diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Thanks. Hi, thanks for your time. Um, there has been much talk and time taken up with disagreement about the value of a DEI audit for our school's policy curriculums and actions. This, this note is to, act, is to recognize one aspect that has received a little attention, but is an essential part of the education of any school and school board that it offers to its students and teachers. And the essentials part is both an attitude and a skill and it is called critical thinking. It is critical thinking, not with a capital C and the word race after it. It is a verb more than a noun. It is a process. And the process is antithetical to the way it has been portrayed by so many FM parents. It has been argued to the board that DEI is an offshoot of totalitarianism, socialism, Marxism, and will promote the development of one way of thinking and speaking. Unfortunately, it is the anti-DEI voice that promotes clinging to the telling of one story. Critical thinking requires that multiple narratives, the marginalized voices, the voices that have not been heard, the lived experience of the many, not just the official history, be included in what students are exposed to and taught. Children must have this multi-layered story in order for a more accurate and full picture of our history to be understood. It is not an attempt to construct or force one version of history upon all. It is not a form of groupthink. It is the opposite. And I want to say here that there are teachers who have been for years trying to include critical thinking as a part of their curriculum. But there are some, and there are some times when critical thinking is not engaged and could be. As mentioned, one requirement for critical thinking to happen is that multiple voices, both minority and majority, be heard. But another requirement is that open-ended questions be a basis for discussion and writing, not only questions with right and wrong answers. This allows for disagreement, agreement, overcoming the fear of difference, learning how to respect difference, finding empathy, working toward justice, finding dissonance in one's own thinking, and resolving a better way forward for all of us. Schools must take on this primary mission throughout all curriculum areas. It can appropriately begin even in early kindergarten and preschool years. Asking questions and opening up the classroom to more and more of children's voices, whether it is solving math problems, solving fights over Legos, thinking about the pros and cons of scientific inventions, or understanding about the effects of racism in our history. Schools play an important role in helping our children learn the processes needed to participate in a multicultural society based on the assumption that all people are created with an equal right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We support, I support the DEI initiatives in our local schools, and we need an administration that stands up strongly to support its teachers to teach the sometimes hard and ugly facets of American history. It cannot be left to the individual teachers to defend the necessary hard discussions our children are capable of having. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and giving me the time. My name is Michelle DeMeo Grace, and I currently have an 11th grader and a 7th grader in the FM School District. We've been in the community now for 17 years. I am here today to urge the board to keep DEI a priority, infusing it into hiring, 
professional development in curriculum and culture across FM. I've spent the last 14 years working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. When I started with USDA, I learned that nationally we spend millions of dollars every year promoting civil rights. As the administrative officer of my agency, I naively didn't understand how we could afford to expend such time and resources on this. I quickly learned that USDA has a history of systemic racial bias and discrimination and treatment of minority farmers and landowners. This goes all the way back to the New Deal. This was my first real in-depth understanding of how systemic racism operates. I was 34 years old, 34. I realized that I needed to do better, both personally and professionally. At USDA, I've also witnessed the transformative power of DEI when leadership, policy, and organizational culture align behind it. It's a process, not a finish line. I asked the board to keep at it. This is important work. Lead FM in this effort. Keep examining and improving DEI here. You all have tremendous power and opportunity to shape the future. In closing, please don't forget to engage your most important customers, the students. Whether it be the BLM Chalk Project, Stop Asian Hate Rally, or educating their parents on pronoun use, I am continually impressed by them. Let them help lead the way. Thank you very much for your time and for what you all do for our community. Thank you. Hello. Well, no, it's too big. There we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Nathan Edwards, uh, and I'm here to voice, uh, voice my support for the district's DEI initiative. I'm a parent of two kids who will be in the FM school district soon, and an uncle to two nieces who attend Fayel and Wellwood. My wife is an FM alum, are, as are her four siblings, uh, and we recently moved back here to raise our family here, uh, mainly because, or in large part, because of the school system. I grew up in a community very similar to this, a uh, very homogeneous uh, uh, community uh, of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. As a white, straight, cisgendered guy, I mostly fit in. I was a little different than my peers, having only a single parent, but that was you know, paled, in paled in comparison to many of my peers who uh, were more disadvantaged than I. This is one of the many areas uh, of difference that FM could do more to actively support and acknowledge their students. Uh, by training, I'm a stem cell biologist, and I believe in the importance of knowledge, curiosity, to help better understand the world, understand the world around us, and deductive uh, reasoning and critical thinking to help us analyze and improve it. We have a call, uh, we have a duty to our children to help uh, them foster this mindset, not just in STEM classes, but in our literature, history, and arts classes as well. Not only when it is convenient, but when it's challenging, and frankly, sometimes when it's uncomfortable. We do our kids a disservice uh, from shielding them from our country's past and our history. The reality of our country is complicated and often painful, and bringing this up and allowing our kids to discuss this is important and imperative. One small example of this is still down the watered down history taught surrounding Christopher Columbus and Columbus Day. We should teach our kids the truth so that we can learn from the past and build a more honest and inclusive future. The DEI mission statement released by the FM district last month has been, is generic and watered down. We need much more specificity in naming the types of differences to be considered and identifying uh, specific action steps to create a more inclusive and equitable learning environment for our kids, especially those who are the most vulnerable to racism, bias, and discrimination. I am hopeful that the board will not be swayed by the vocal minority who are against this change and, will, uh, and hope that you will soon release a more comprehensive and action-oriented action DEI plan. Thank you for your time. Uh, good evening, my name is Sterling Waters. Uh, I am the father of a fourth grader at Fayel. Um, I'm here because I had noticed on the school calendar uh, that uh, 
Columbus Day was recognized, but we currently do not have Indigenous Peoples Day recognized on the school calendar. Uh, in light of the fact that the town of Manlius uh, recently adopted a resolution to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day, uh, and also uh, President Biden himself uh, recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day, I simply came here to ask, uh, is there something that uh, we could do as a community, uh, as well as our relationship with the Haudenosaunee uh, to also uh, recognize Indigenous Peoples Day in addition to uh, Columbus Day? Thank you. Good evening. It's great to be here in person. It's the first time in a long time, right? Great. Well, the principals and I are pleased to be here this evening to share the building plans and goals based on the district's strategic plan. The last time we were together um, to present the strategic plan was the fall of 2019 and we were making great progress and strides towards the accomplishment of the goals identified at that time. Uh, and then March 2020 hit, and like everything else in the world, we, we paused and uh, interrupted uh, to focus on immediate student needs and instructional design within the pandemic or in the pandemic. So this past spring and summer, we had the opportunity to begin to reset and in anticipation of students returning to school full time, the administrative cabinet got together uh, over the summer and in the spring, and we revised and um, revised the district goals and the strategic plan. From there, the building principals met with their building action teams and revised building level goals. You will notice the timelines have been adjusted to accommodate for changes over this period of, of time. And just as a reminder, the building level plans and goals are aligned with the components of the district strategic plan, including our vision. Our vision as a school community is to inspire students and to promote personal success. Also, the building plans are uh, aligned with the mission, um, commitment to academic excellence, focus on authentic learning experiences, civic responsibility, innovative programs, in an environment that fosters meaningful relationships, supports the overall wellness of each student, and promotes continuous improvement in our uh, four priority areas. So <clears throat> I'll just touch briefly on the um, priority areas and the district goals, just as a reminder and also to give you context for the building plans that you're, we're gonna devote the majority of this presentation on. So in, in the area of teaching and learning, revising curriculum and instruction to address the New York State standards, frameworks and regulations, in just about every content area, we are um, revising and incorporating new New York standards. Some of those standards are newer than others, but much of that work was paused during the pandemic. Uh, in terms of uh, framework, uh, the newest framework uh, that we are focusing on this school year is the New York State Culturally Responsive Sustaining Education Framework and um, you will see that work represented in the building level goals as well. In terms of uh, district technology infrastructure and advancing instructional technology, 
We are certainly capitalizing on all the growth and skills we made last year during the pandemic, or in this year during the pandemic. Um, also, you will later on this year have an opportunity to our, uh, take a look at our tech plan, which will be revised. We're also focusing on this area, in this area, on uh, K through two, K through twelve coding, in uh, content areas and infusion, infusing coding in those uh, content areas, and media literacy is a focus as well um, with the technology um, committee. Professional learning, that is hallmark of Fayetteville Manlius, I believe, and we have uh, this fall been able to return to teachers uh, attending conferences. We have recently publicized um, additional FM in service courses. Uh, we had a great guest speaker, Dr. Anschell, to kick off the school year. And uh, we have a district-wide speaker in um, November, Mark Mambretti, who will focus on one of the principles in the uh, culturally uh, responsive framework, the um, welcoming and affirming environment. And you'll be hearing much more about that. And there also will be a professional learning report at the, I believe, January um, board meeting. Um, we will be doing that. In terms of uh, positive um, school environment, again, just to highlight, we uh, have, are expanding the CSIRO and the SPO program. You'll hear in the building reports about learning spaces now and as we're planning into the future that support student inquiry, innovation, and collaboration. As um, President Mims just mentioned, the next month we will have an in-depth uh, presentation about mental health uh, services, but you will also, in the building plans, hear more about instructional um, uh, initiatives in, the, in that area as well. And uh, <clears throat> in the area of service learning and community partnerships, we are re-engaging our partnership with the Tri-State Consortium, and we will be uh, uh, re-engaging with them and also planning for a district visit and consultancy sometime next year, maybe in the fall or possibly in um, the spring, depending on, on uh, how that work goes. And again, you will hear about partnerships and service learning in the um, building plans. And again, in the area of uh, priority area of fiscal capacity and responsibility, maintaining our strong financial position, completing capital improvement projects, and monitoring the long range facilities plan to make sure that our facilities are responsive to contemporary teaching and learning and support a productive work environment for all employees. So that is the context of our larger district strategic plan, and now I'm gonna turn it over to our principals for uh, an overview of their building plans and building goals, beginning with our elementary um, principals. Good evening, thank you. Um, thank you for this opportunity. It's always great to be able to share our building plans and we're standing here together tonight, Debbie, John, and I. We, as you know, as elementary principals, we work very closely together to ensure consistency and coordination across our buildings. So um, we're gonna be presenting together. Uh, for the priority area of teaching and learning, um, our building level goal is focusing on the professional learning of our staff and addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Our staff has had the opportunity to participate in book studies around DEI. In addition, there are multiple in-service classes being offered and our upcoming staff development day, like Mary mentioned, will focus on that CRSE framework, specifically that first principle, creating a welcoming and affirming atmosphere. The elementary li library media specialists are also participating in BOCES leadership opportunities and are involved in an audit with suggestions for improvement. To date, all three buildings are collaborating with our HSAs and we are receiving donations and purchasing bilingual books for students. Finally, uh, we are partnering with Interfaith Works again to plan a dialogue club to be offered to our fourth grade students. The goal of this dialogue club will be to produce an environment where students can safely examine their own identities, 
build self-confidence and acceptance, build cross-cultural understanding, create an atmosphere of belonging, and become allies for social inclusion efforts within each of our buildings. This program is still in the planning stages at the moment, and our goal is to begin this dialogue club before the second semester. And I'll turn it over to Debbie. Good evening. Thank you for your time and for this opportunity. At all three elementary schools, ensuring a positive school environment has always been a foundational goal for our school communities. During a typical school year, mental health supports and social emotional learning are a priority. However, as we all know, the pandemic over the last 18 months has caused this building goal to become even more essential. In order to increase the services that support the mental health and well being of our students, we are utilizing multiple strategies, programs, and interventions. At the elementary level, we continue to expand our use of Second Step. Second Step is a research-based, teacher-informed, and classroom-tested program which promotes social-emotional development, safety, and the well-being of students in kindergarten through fourth grade. These lessons are being utilized by our school counselors, school psychologists, and classroom teachers with an at-home component as well. In each of the buildings, we have also expanded our use of flexible seating for students. We purchase new student desks, seating, and classroom tables for some of our classrooms, which will allow for flexible use and movement as needed. Our goal is to continue to attain this kind of flexible furniture for other classrooms in the future. Additionally, we have been mindful to offer specialized and targeted social emotional support to our students who were either new, returning from being homeschooled, or were remote learners last year. Our goal was to ensure as smooth and welcoming a transition as possible to school when we reopened this fall. Although our efforts are consistent and aligned across the three elementary schools, we do have some unique differences that reflect our own individual school community needs. At Enders Road Elementary, we have expanded our peaceful place and brought back the Motor Lab. These new spaces offer an opportunity for individual students or whole classes to visit to have movement breaks, meet sensory needs, and regulate emotions so that students' bodies are just right to learn. At Fayetteville Elementary, they have expanded the district's therapy dog program and welcomed Piper, who is visiting their school two times per week to offer additional support to the whole school community. The students and staff enthusiastically welcome her to Fayetteville. At Mott Road Elementary, they are very excited to have begun to engage in the Positivity Project. They are holding monthly community building assemblies and reframing their character education program to facilitate an other people matter mindset. Through all of these programs and strategies, the elementary schools continue to focus on how best to support our students' mental health and social emotional skills so that all learners can feel safe, comfortable, and ready to learn. Jana will now share about our efforts in the area of community partnerships and service learning. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Thank you to Debbie and Eileen for taking us through the elementary goals for creating a positive school environment and teaching and learning. We are looking forward to getting back on track with things that have been delayed since COVID or from hybrid learning. Um, and as reflected in each building's plans, both our goals and strategies have encompassed multiple years given those circumstances. At all three elementary schools, we have created or reestablished serving service learning partnerships programs that increase mentorship opportunities for our students. These partnerships focus on opportunities that are aligned with cur the curriculum and enhance student learning. All three buildings will be participating in the McMahon Ryan High Five program through our health classes. The McMahon Ryan Child Advocacy Center has developed a comprehensive program for both at home and in school that will give children the skills to help them be safe, happy, and healthy. 
Skills include healthy feelings, instincts, personal body safety, and internet safety. At all three buildings, we will also facilitate experiences where we pair our students with their older FM student peers, either from the middle school or high school. While we are all unified in our goals and have similar programming, the ways we aim to achieve these goals and opportunities differ slightly from one another. At Fayetteville Elementary, students will be participating in the B Council where the council will help to plan and facilitate different community service efforts. Enders Road will be participating in this year's duck race to, through Interfaith Works, which aims to end racism. Additionally, Project Bridge is another effort being made with students at Enders Road. This is again a mentorship partnership with middle school and high school students. As Debbie mentioned, Mott Road will be reestablishing some of our character ed programming with some new, new facets, but we will also be going back to our career lunch chats during the latter portion of the year. Given the fact we are a little bit more tech savvy, we will remote different careers into our cafeteria and allow students to choose what they're most interested in. We also have established a kindness club and are very, very excited about engaging in the positivity project where we do community outreach each month. This week or this month, we are partnering with Rise Above the Streets, um, a local nonprofit organization. We are looking forward to continuing and or starting new goal work related to our priority areas and sincerely appreciate the support of the board as we have reinstated many of our programs and continue to make students' experience at FM second to none. Thank you for your time. And some cute pictures for you to look at. Did I leave the dogs up long enough? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you once again for welcoming us to a board meeting. I also wanna thank you for all of the support that you've shown our schools over the past few years. On behalf of Maureen McChrystal, who regrets um, being unable to join us this evening, I am pleased to provide an overview of the Eagle Hill Middle School 2021-2022 building goals and strategies, as well as Wellwood's goals. As reflected in each building's plans, both our goals and strategies encompass multiple years. The hybrid and remote learning models of the 2020-2021 school year, along with the unique responsibilities placed on public schools in collaboration with the local health department during an international pandemic shifted the pace, timeline, and focus of needs in our school building plans. At both Eagle Hill and Wellwood, our expert teachers have designed, implemented, and continually refined innovative learning opportunities that support inquiry, collaboration, and choice while balancing the unchartered path of remote and hybrid instruction. Exemplifying the best of our practice, the entire Eagle Hill staff found genuine and student-centered approaches to continue to build the school community. In a time of fear and uncertainty, the relationships within their classrooms and between their school and community continue to thrive. As educators, colleagues, and members of the Fayetteville Manlius community, there is refined attention to the role of schools as imperative in providing opportunities for the best interest of adolescents' academic, emotional, and social well-being. While engaging students in real-world problem solving, the teachers at Eagle Hill focused on students' connectedness and wellness. Select Eagle Hill Middle School teachers approached Wednesdays as a model for weekly wellness activities during the last school year, and that will serve as a model for further consideration and refinement this school year. Through in-person and remote platforms, students showed evidence of learning, attempts at new strategies, risk-taking, and achievements, and all of that continues to lead learning at Eagle Hill. Flexing in ways they could never have foreseen, the schedule continues to be an opportunity for collaboration in cross-curricular project-based learning. With foldable walls between some of the classrooms and shared loft spaces, the appreciation of time and physical space together is reflected in Eagle Hill's plans for the future. Further, given the timeline of potential facility projects for Eagle Hill, they will focus on considering options to repurpose the loft spaces and shared spaces between classrooms. 
teaching and learning at Eagle Hill will continue to evolve because of the educational expertise and skill of the faculty. Last year did not promote the investigation and creation of unique academic intervention, enrichment, or multidisciplinary courses. However, Principal McChrystal, Eagle Hill's literacy specialist, and the math intervention specialists look forward to re-engaging in collaboration with colleagues for Eagle Hill to continue as a model school. Developing and enhancing emotional and social opportunities to support all students in an inclusive and flexible setting that enrich health and wellness will be an intentional focus this school year for Eagle Hill. There are four experts in student support services, the two school counselors, school psychologists, and family school liaison are designing and piloting a program for students available during enrichment period. Revisiting the enrichment period opportunities and mentorship between students and staff provide opportunities for growth. Beyond the character traits of the Positivity Project, Eagle Hill piloted involvement in community-wide dialogue, joining Wellwood and high school with their participation. The community-wide dialogue school exchange program was a series of conversations between Eagle Hill and Syracuse City School H.W. Smith Middle School. Students from each school come together to participate in structured group discussions about issues relating to race, stereotyping, the power of being an ally, and taking action. These discussions will help students gain perspective about the community in which they live and make connections with students across the area. In the words of their students, I would never have known about others' day-to-day -day experiences at their school without community-wide dialogue. John, Antoine, and Michaela, current first-year students at FM High School and members of the class of 2025, starred in a video created to share with Eagle Hill students about the experience. And here is the introduction. Discussions will help you gain perspective about the community in which you live and make connections with students across the area. So our participants in community-wide dialogue, why don't you guys start out by telling us what you like the best about? Um, well, our dialogue is like very conversational and not like guided. Really. Like, like, Oh, I agree with John there. I feel like I'm like everyone participated. There are also games you guys feel like and it's doing something on stage, which I think I'm going on stage. Third is that people were always very understanding and we tried to really see uh, stories from people who saw them from the group. And it was really interesting to see what people had come through because some of it I was in.
that is not what I wanted to do. Okay. Under the priority area of positive school environment, Wellwood continues to work with expanding social emotional learning and support for our students. Our counselors and psychologists are continuing to utilize the second step program with our small counseling groups. This year, with the leadership of our family school liaison, we are working closely with our instructional staff to utilize the student risk screening scale to identify our students who may require some additional social emotional support. This will also help us to prioritize the students and families for our family school liaison to support. Along with our counselors, she will structure social emotional support to address their needs while at school. For the past few years, you'll likely recall that our counseling team at Wellwood was researching, was researching mentoring programs in other schools. Wellwood is very excited this year to roll out our own version of a mentoring program, which we've named the Support Squad. We expect to make adjustments and refinements to the program as we move through the year and experience what works best for our students and staff. Our Character Education Committee continues to look for additional ways to embed the Positivity Project in our daily interactions with others. The committee has charged themselves with increasing recognition for those making extra efforts to develop positive relationships with others with emphasis on peer-to-peer -peer recognition. This work will continue to be very important as we lean on, on one another and on our strengths to successfully meet the challenges that, we'll, that we will face this year. Our work with our Project Pass It On program continues this year as well as we support Rise Above Poverty. Like in the past, we will create service learning opportunities for our entire school community. And as you are very well aware, this is a very big year for Wellwood with the completion of the construction within the building. The planning and communication associated with a project of this size will continue to be at the forefront of our work this year. The moves that will occur mid-year will perhaps be the most complicated of the project as we will have more than 20 classrooms moving within the same time frame. Not only will communication occur with staff, but it is very important that our students understand how and when their schedules will change as well. The changes that have been made to our building have been exceptional. While the burden has been plentiful for our staff related to all of the extra pieces associated with a project this size, all staff have been very pleased with the changes made and all are excited for this last phase to be complete. Our renovated classrooms are beautiful, the temperature control is such a welcome change, and now our building feels more accessible with the addition of the ramp and the new main foyer. With the turnover of the second floor later this year, we will have three project classrooms available for teachers to sign out. These flexible learning spaces have been outfitted with flexible furniture and technology to allow teachers to support our students in creative learning environments. Thank you, and I appreciate all of your time. It's always difficult going last after you have some incredible colleagues uh, leading, leading the way. Um, first, I have to start off by recognizing the incredible work that's occurred in all buildings beginning in March 2019. Um, when you think about the, the great lift that was placed upon teachers uh, at a moment's notice and ways in which they had to focus on rethinking what instruction looked like, on a day-to-day -day basis, on a weekly basis, monthly and yearly basis. Um, it's really extraordinary. Um, and the fact that we are back together, uh, seeing each other every single day has been absolutely incredible. And we are so grateful that we're able to come back together to start uh, much of the work that we started prior to the pandemic because so much energy was placed on trying to connect students with learning and with each other and with the, the, the school community um, at a time that none of us could have imagined. Uh, and so I have to give incredible thanks to not only every educator, um, teacher, staff member, uh, custodial maintenance, administrator, and to the Board of Education and to our entire community uh, that has truly been uh, a team 
effort. Uh, and we're so uh, grateful that we seem to be headed down uh, a path to get us all back to some, some true normalcy. You'll notice that much of the high school plan um, mirrors uh, a plan that was uh, delivered to you a number of years ago. Um, because there's some pretty hefty goals ultimately with it within that. Uh, in teaching and learning, our focus was trying to expand definition for success of students, families through communication, changes in programming and curricular offerings. One item that uh, a committee of educators at the high school wanted to look at very closely was exploring offering only um, the five required Regents exams that you needed for a Regents diploma. And behind that is to eliminate offering additional. Uh, and it's interesting, about the same time that we started looking at this, the Board of Regents announced the uh, Blue Ribbon Committee on Graduation Requirements. And there's still a survey out that that work has come back. And there are five kind of foundational questions that they're asking the community, um, and which was, what do we want students to know and be able to do before they graduate? How do we want students to demonstrate such knowledge and skills? How do you measure learning and achievement as it pertains to that last question to ensure they're indicators of high school completion? How can we measure, how can measures of achieve, achievement accurately reflect the skills and knowledge of our special populations, such as students with disabilities and English language learners? And what course requirements or examinations will ensue that students are prepared for college and careers or civic engagement? Um, the amazing thing is, is that we were asking very similar questions at the same time the state was introducing this information. And so um, this is something that we're gonna continue our work in. Uh, this actually came to us because of some work through Tri-States and my work with Bronxville uh, and a number of other schools downstate that do uh, only offer the five uh, exams. And the, it opens up some great flexibility for high schools and targeting students um, where uh, their most interest. So we will uh, continue that work. We wish to ex continue exploring the Link Crew program and offering the year-long program and review other character education programs to, of course, improve the experience for all students. Um, again, Link Crew is, is very focused at the very beginning of, of the year, um, and it ends. And while it's been incredibly positive, there's so much more that we can do. Um, and, but there's more that we need to do throughout the course of freshman year, but we also need to do a great deal more for our sophomores and our juniors. Our sophomores even this year um, than, than most years because their freshman year was so interrupted. Uh, and so uh, we're continuing to look for new opportunities to connect students throughout the course of the year. And a big piece that really uh, kind of came to um, light throughout uh, the past 18 months was ensuring that we have really clear, consistent communication messaging to all stakeholders at the high school so that everyone, whether they're, they can go to a parent night or whether they can uh, attend a special event, has access to all the information they need about academic, social, career opportunities as they tr transition throughout a high school career. It's so important for us to include additional modalities and we need to find more ways to connect with our school community. For positive school environment, the focus on identify and evaluate potential changes to the high school schedule to support student achievement and their mental health and well-being. This is very focused, of course, on the start time study uh, that was completed last year. But also, it's also a great deal of conversation that surrounds the upcoming capital project referendum that'll be coming in front of the voters within the next month. Um, at the high school, we continue to use the exact same schedule that has been a part of Fayetteville Manlius High School since it started. It is an eight period day, it is 40 minutes. Hannah will tell you, it's manic. We're running, 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 and running. Um, and we believe that there are better ways for us to do this. Um, and while if, uh, some additional added uh, improvements in the facility will of course help, even without that, there's a great deal that we feel like we can do to better serve our students. 
um, but it will require some really significant lifting, not only at the administrative level, but also for, for teachers as well, because we have to reimagine how we do everything. Um, and so that work will continue throughout the course of the next couple of years as well. Continuing with positive school environment and focus on the increasing of offerings to our students. Um, the expansion of our therapy dog program, we're very excited to have brought that to the district a number of years ago with Kiki, our first therapy dog. Um, we now have three at the high school. Kiki retired uh, at the end of last year, um, but we do have three at the high school. We have Charlie, uh, we have Joey, and new to us this year with our new family school liaison at the high school is Maisie. Um, we've noticed that at the high school, uh, we probably need more than just three. Uh, these dogs are exhausted after a single day. Um, sometimes they can do two, uh, but it is a lot of work. And when you're talking about the build, uh, building a size of Fayetteville Manlius High School with approximately 1,400 students, uh, there's a lot of need there. Um, and so we've seen such positive success. We're looking for more ways to, of course, expand that program. We're looking to expand Wellness Day activities outside of just Wellness Day. Um, we were very proud of that when that started a number of years ago, but our focus has been on how do we consistently incorporate wellness activities into every day as a part of being a Fayetteville Manly High School student. We're looking this year specifically, uh, and Heidi will talk to you probably a little bit more about this in her presentation uh, in a couple of weeks, but investigating the use of a research-based screening tool to assess student emotional health and risk for our students. Um, there is a great deal of, of research out there and we wanna find the best program for our students in our community. Uh, there was a significantly large committee uh, focused on homework um, prior to the start of pandemic and we're starting that work again and focus on collecting additional data both from our students but also the community, meaning parents and teachers um, and want to focus back on developing true philosophy statements at the high school level that helps guide our work um, when we're talking about homework at the high school level. Institute time management activity is part of the course selection process. We know our students are uh, very engaged and want to take the most and the best uh, that is offered to them. Well, we also want to try to provide them as much information as possible to help them in that process. And so we're looking at trying to start uh, incorporating that in part of our scheduling process. We're gonna continue to collect data on student stressors. Um, that's through surveys that we have done throughout, throughout the years. We're gonna continue to do that work and use that data to make changes to our daily programming. Review current high school mental health and well-being activities, offerings and services, and look for possible improvements, effectiveness, and or change. Again, that continuous improvement, looking to continually find new opportunities to support all of our students. And create a communication, whether it be a pamphlet or additional communication pieces for parents that highlights what we are doing at the high school in support of our students' mental health and well-being. Um, people can't access it if they don't know it's there. And so we need to do a better job of providing clear uh, information to all of our students and their families as to what is accessible to them um, and provide the resources necessary. Questions from any of us? I would just echo what you've said, Marissa. It is always so helpful to us as a board to hear what, I mean, this is a huge list of things that are happening. Some we knew, some we didn't know. So thank you all very much. And I'd like to thank everybody for their hard work. You mentioned the educators, custodial staff, um, transportation, food service, uh, everybody really did a lot of teamwork to get through the last 18 months and um, we really appreciate um, 
this update and just so happy everybody's back together. Thank you, President Mims. Uh, I have a couple of superintendent reports, so the general information one to begin. Uh, mental health update. As some of you may know, on Wednesday, October 13th, uh, the Office of Civil Rights uh, issued a memorandum to school districts in conjunction with World Mental Health Day to draw our attention to the importance of supporting students who may be at uh, risk for self-harm or suicide. Uh, as you heard tonight, our Director of Counseling will be reporting out to the Board of Education about the different services uh, that are available within the Fayetteville Manlius Central School District. Um, they're also publishing a desk reference, as Dr. Kilmer indicated, for families uh, that will give an overview of all the different uh, tiers that are available. And also, and we're excited about it, uh, we're in the process of consulting with legal counsel to develop a request for proposals uh, for drop-in services that we've heard from our community of being important. Uh, it's in regard to teletherapy, and uh, we're very excited about the potential of this. Our legal counsel has helped other school districts and this will truly be something that will be able to be a drop-in service that is provided. I will keep the board updated uh, regarding that. On strategic planning updates, certainly like to thank Dr. Coughlin and all our building administrators for sharing their most recent building action plans. I'm delighted of all that they have accomplished and the aspirations and the goals for the year ahead. As you know, many of our accomplishments have been captured in our annual report. You should have a copy provided for you. They just literally and figuratively came in today. Uh, so they are available for you to take a look at uh, and will be mailed out to all stakeholders in our community. And furthermore, as we look ahead to the future, I'm pleased to share our most recent strategic planning poster. I included it in board docs. I know our district clerk has been switching them over in the frames and will be ready to unveil them after the presentations this evening in all six of our buildings. Um, as far as digital equity survey, in response to a recent request uh, by the government that our district will be sending out a digital equity survey where our families will be able to provide feedback regarding their children's access to technology infrastructure and connectivity during the pandemic. And so we will be able to report back. Uh, we met uh, with our IT department today at the district office meeting, and those results will be due uh, later on this fall. 
And last but not least, capital project update. I'd like to thank the Board of Education for approving the capital improvement project for FM High School at the October 4th meeting. This project, which will go before the voters, will address many of the building infrastructure needs, including improvements to the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. It will also address a number of programmatic needs that you've heard Dr. Kilmer uh, talk about, including a new STEM edition and an expanded cafeteria concourse that will allow for improved pedestrian traffic flow between House 1 and House 2. Other improvements include the auditorium acoustical upgrades, new classroom casework enhancements, and the centralization of the main office nurse's office suite right in the knuckle of the building. So even as we look to the future, I cannot help but be impressed with all that we've accomplished with the current capital building project involving Wellwood, Enders Road, and the library media center and restrooms at FM High School. With an official ribbon cutting for Wellwood and community open house scheduled for the afternoon of Tuesday, November 2nd, the general election day when many of our community will be out and about, I take great pleasure in sharing with you a sneak preview of a video that will be shown to those who attend the open house. We will also take the liberty to share the video with others uh, using our social media platforms and the school district website. And without further ado, and hopefully technology works. Back in the winter of 2017, Fayetteville Manlius residents voted on and successfully passed a $45.2 million facilities project that added space at Wellwood Middle School and Enders Road Elementary, updated the library media center at the high school, and replaced aging infrastructure around the district. The project is now complete and students are already enjoying these great spaces. Our old library was, uh, was renovated in the 1990s, so it was really designed for a different kind of student and a different kind of use. So we, we really needed to expand the library to meet 21st century needs. So you'll see that we have uh, outlets everywhere so that students can plug in we have a dedicated classroom, which we never had before. Uh, it is checked out by a lot of teachers, and we do collaborative work with teachers and classes in that uh, space. Tables where a student can work by themselves or they can work with others. With the new wing, we have three beautiful classrooms for third grade. We have a maker space, which is a wonderful place for our students and staff to go to really work on different group projects, some really neat, um, project-based learning. It, the spaces here in the wing are wonderful and are beautiful and bright and um, just current flexible furniture, but it's also allowed us across the building to be able to expand some of those other spaces that were really cramped. So our motor lab has different stations um, that our occupational therapist and our physical therapist set up and students are able to practice those skills to get their bodies just right for learning. We were able to take our beginning of a peaceful place, which started in a small closet, and actually have it join a, a regular size room or a, an office room um, and filled it with lots of activities and objects that students can help to reset, rejuvenate, and renew. The first phase of the Wellwood facility project brought about very positive changes for the school cafeteria and instructional spaces are no longer in the basement and the HVAC system is efficient and allows for a comfortable learning environment. Also new to Wellwood are collaborative project spaces. Wellwood has had quite a transformation over the past 18 months. We began using the spaces that were included in the first phase of the facility project last February. The project rooms were constructed to offer collaborative learning spaces so that as teachers require larger spaces for students to complete labs or projects, we now have a dedicated space outside of the regular classroom. What's most exciting is that these rooms are in addition to spaces that we've always had that have also been renovated. Our large group instruction room, our library, and even our new main foyer allow for students to have collaborative learning spaces to work. We'll be able to monitor different inventories and stuff with some of the new equipment. 
Um, it'll be able to cook better, different things. We have panini machines, new um, coolers. I think the new remodeled kitchen is uh, pulling lots of children, uh, students in for some new and improved meals with food service. I think one of the biggest things for us now in this room, but this whole hallway area, is that we are next to the band room now, and the core rooms are there, so we actually get to be a department as teachers, versus before orchestra was like the fifth grade hallway, and band was in the basement, with chorus in the basement, and we have a really great recording sound system, but generally just having the state of the art facility with the sound system, the sound noise cancellation that's going on, that's really important and pretty big for us too. So certainly thank you to the Board of Education's vision and the community support uh, for that project. Uh, it allows us to certainly celebrate all of our accomplishments uh, thanks to our Capital Region BOCES Communication Department. Uh, that's one video. We're working on a second video for the November board meeting that will highlight uh, some of the challenges facing us and uh, rationale behind the high school project. So that ends my first report. Not a question, but um, thank you for sharing that preview of the video. And it's just um, so wonderful to see the spaces in action, to see the students using the spaces and to see the, the staff really enjoying those spaces and being able to improve their teaching and learning. So it's definitely the reason why we do the things we do and it's great to see. So I just have two quick ones. The building action plans that we saw tonight, are those uploaded? Did I miss an upload of those or will they be? Okay. And then just on scheduling, um, you said that the uh, mental health presentation was scheduled for November 8th. In future meeting agendas, the, the mental health curriculum report has been listed for December 13. So we had talked about December. Uh, the availability of uh, Heidi Green, our director of counseling, is November. So we've moved the library media center overview uh, to December. And then, as Dr. Coughlin indicated, professional learning will be in January. OK, thank you. Thank you. For those of you that didn't get enough of me on the first go around, this is uh, the COVID update report. Just trying to give you a lay of the land. You'll notice I uploaded everything per your request uh, last week, uh, but if you see some changes here, I try to go over it today as I usually do with the up-to-date statistics. So uh, it may be a little different than what you read, but it's still basically the same format as what was released uh, last week. Uh, item one, COVID update, as the month of October reaches its midpoint, to date we've had 56 confirmed cases in the district, with 38 coming at the middle high school level and only 18 at the elementary level. Nevertheless, those 18 positive cases at the elementary level resulted in 101 quarantines. Uh, that's an average of 5.6 average across all three elementary buildings whereas there have only been 35 total quarantines at the secondary level, which you can do the math as less than one quarantine per positive case for the middle schools and high school. Symptomatic update at this point of the school year, the district has sent home about 166 students because they were symptomatic. Uh, overall, considering the number of students we have and the fact that we're almost two months into the year, I think that is testimonial to our families uh, who are keeping children home who may be symptomatic. So to have only 166 need to be sent home for a couple of months is pretty impressive given our enrollment. This includes 53 students at the high school, 29 students at each of the middle schools, and about an average of 18 children in each of the elementary buildings. A quarantine analysis, I'm pleased to report, thanks to the work of Mr. Jeff Gordon, Mr. Bill Furlong, 
Mr. John Cunningham of our Transportation Department and Mr. Russ McCarty of our Buildings and Grounds Department, we've tapped into bus monitors and have invited them to work as lunch supervisors uh, to allow our three elementary buildings to divide the students up between the cafeteria and the classrooms during the lunch period. To support this endeavor, our Buildings and Grounds Department is providing additional support uh, from the maintenance department and substitute custodians to clean uh, these additional spaces during the lunch periods. We remain hopeful that this will reduce the number of potential quarantines whenever a positive case is reported. Under indoor events and spectators during the pandemic, with the approach of the winter athletic season and with more indoor events, such as special events, such as vocal and instrumental music concerts, as well as theatrical productions, school administrators are meeting in advance to establish parameters for spectators. At this point in time, masks, it is certain, will be mandated and proper social distancing for those individuals outside of a particular family unit attending event will be required. On online tutoring, given the 86 quarantines uh, at the elementary level, the school district officials have, or I, that sh I didn't update that, that should be 101. Quarantines at the elementary level, school district officials have recruited retired teachers to serve as online tutors for elementary children who may be out on quarantine. Classroom teachers will still be responsible for posting assignments on Schoology and forwarding the instructional print materials home to the students. Uh, based on uh, the lesson. That being said, our primary goal, as we indicated earlier, is trying to reduce the number of quarantines associated with the lunch period and the school bus. New York State Department of Health guidance, as we indicated before, we're working to comply with County Executive Order number 22, which requires all school staff to get vaccinated or to submit for weekly testing. We've kind of leveled out at about the mid-30s for employees who are participating in weekly COVID screening. And certainly a shout out to Mr. Gordon and the nurses for helping with that and organizing that. And last but not least, surveillance testing. As mentioned earlier, Onondaga County continues to collaborate with local area school districts for random testing of students and employees at periodic intervals. So over the course of the past four weeks, thanks to Mr. Gordon's direction, FM has sampled 277 individuals, 253 students, 24 staff, with no reported positive cases on the portal at Quadrant Biosciences. That ends my COVID report. It's almost like. So Craig, just to, um, if we could get a little bit more further information on how students that end up in quarantine, how they access these retired teachers that are helping with online learning. Are they proactively, are the elementary schools proactively reaching out and setting up those appointments? Do the parents need to contact the school? How exactly does that work? I didn't see that posted on our website yet, so I, I know it's probably still in process. Let me take that, Dr. Tice. Uh, so we have one teacher right now who's hired for the Cape 4 uh, and she has an ongoing list that she receives from the building principals and she is uh, contacting parents and um, then if they are interested in having a Google Meet set up, um, she is arranging that um, and, and uh, following through on their schoolwork that the teachers are providing, but in addition to that can provide extension activities as well. In addition to the, um, that tutor who's separate and aside, we also have asked our enrichment teachers at the K-4 level and at the 5-8 level to be available to help students with organizational um, work as well. Great, thank you, Dr. Tom. Sure. Yeah, we're going to try to finalize that this week. Great, thank you. And the lunch programming, thanks to Mr. Gordon and Mr. Furlong's help, began today. And Dr. Tice, um, thank you for and thank you to the administration and 
all the staff that are stepping up um, at the elementary level to make that happen, just to be clear for the community, by spreading the students out a little bit more than six feet, my understanding is by spreading students out more than six feet apart during lunch, if there is a positive case in their vicinity, they will not have to quarantine. Is that correct? Correct, that's the plan. Unless the guideline. I just had As of work, this I just had to work time. that As in of there. this time stamp. <laughs> Positive thoughts. And sorry, one more question about indoor acti indoor events. Is I understand that, that this is all the details are being worked out, but is there a general move towards having um, most events become in person, whether they're recognitions or concerts? I mean, are there? I'm just kind of curious where we're headed. Yeah, we're working on that. Certainly the fallback is virtual. Uh, I know there was a letter that came in and we're trying to make that an in-person event. We're, we're, that's, we're trying to do that uh, where all possible. Uh, we are challenged uh, in terms of capacity for indoor events, whether it's interscholastic athletics or theatrical concert productions. We want to include as many as possible without necessarily rationing the number of tickets that are available that allows family units to sit together. Uh, but then if they can keep a social distance between the next family unit, uh, we'll try to pack as many in as we can for the athletic events and the concerts. Thank you. So I, I just have one quick follow up on that and, and more on the, um, the music programs that obviously have always been one of FM's hallmarks. Um, we obviously, yes, have space challenges here, but has there been any work done on looking at other venues that we may be able to secure for some of these events so that there's a greater capacity, the greater number of people that can fit in those even distanced? At this point, we haven't. We've been trying to host everything on site. So I think that'll be the other thing, is if we're getting pressed in terms of having to limit tickets, we may have to look at other venues. Okay. But I if at all possible to keep the costs to a minimum for the taxpayers, we're trying to keep them on site. No, I just, yeah, I mean, I just think about, you know, obviously, as we've heard with some of the funding that we have received, COVID-related, that if that's something that should at least be perhaps looked into and, and, and priced out so that we can make some informed decisions on things like that. Things like SRC is obviously much greater space than anything that we have available if places like OCC would even be willing to make those spaces available. But even like we've done with our musicals in the spring, as you know, we all offer multiple performances. We typically haven't done that for concerts, offering multiple performances, but that could be something we could explore as well. Um, no, I think you heard our external auditors. The only thing I would like to do is publicly thank our assistant superintendent, Bill Furlong, also Lynn Fryer, our accounting supervisor, Cheryl Conley, our treasurer, all the account clerks, payroll clerks, and purchasing agents for such a great job. Um, they didn't say it publicly, but they told us at our audit meeting that this was phenomenal work by our team, and by far that they were the most prepared of any of the districts they work with. It's just an outstanding team, and I think we can't say it often enough. So thank you very much. The other two brief things is um, we're still looking for a deputy claims adjuster, auditor, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And Katie Phillips, our uh, claims auditor, will be attending our November 8th meeting for her annual visit. So the minutes pretty well covered our meeting. Um, I would say we've decided not to host the elected officials meet and greet this year um, in favor of a more strategic um, partnership with our elected officials. And there is a big election this year that's pretty highly contested. So 
once that election is um, completed, we planned on sending congratulatory letters um, to all the new elected officials and then engaging our administration in figuring out where there could be some strategic partnerships with our local officials. We thought that would be a more fruitful use of time and staff and um, district resources than the meet and greet, which is really lovely, but we don't really usually have a lot of time to talk substantively about um, the meat of our work together. We did get a preview of the referendum, all the community relations work around the referendum and our, our team is doing a wonderful job as evidenced by the preview of the video we saw tonight. Um, we talked about the changes in COVID-19 reporting and really how, and that's been much more targeted to families that may have had an exposure by grade level um, so that rather than getting a blast every time there's, <laughs> there's cases in the district, um, it's, it's much more targeted, which is, was really in response to the feedback we were hearing from community members. And we did get some updates that were already mentioned on the DEI training that's upcoming in partnership with OCM BOCES and um, we're eager to, to see what that looks like and hopefully those dates will be forthcoming soon so we can move forward with those efforts. That was pretty much it. Not, uh, the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee has not met, but we'll get a doodle out this week for a the next meeting. Um, next, facilities. Dan? Uh, sure. The, the, the minutes you have, I won't repeat those. Just really just two, I think just two things that we'll touch on real quickly. Um, Wellwood, um, as, as has been said, is both significantly ahead of schedule and significantly under budget, um, which are both obviously very um, great achievements by the entire team that's been working on that from the architects to DGA and, 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 and certainly the entire uh, administration and uh, Melissa Corbin's efforts. So it's, it's great, pro great progress that's uh, going to come to a rapid conclusion very soon on Wellwood. So that's, that's great work. And then I will say probably the same thing that I will say at every single meeting until this vote happens in December. Um, the importance of the high school capital project, both from an infrastructure perspective and a programmatic perspective, and it being, for those who haven't heard me say it before who are watching this meeting, um, is the project that touches the one building through which every single student in this district will pass through, and so it will therefore impact every single student in this district, um, and has great importance to be able to move forward with that. Um, other than that, I'll leave the facilities to the, the minutes that you have available to you. Thank you. Next, uh, finance, Mark. Uh, just two highlights. Uh, the budget calendar, you'll note, is further on in the agenda. Uh, very similar to previous years, um, but the highlights will be the budget workshops that uh, will be presented. And then the beginning of our long-range financial plan. Uh, the immediate future looks bright, um, but it's always good to look several years ahead and to see where there might be any budgetary pressures uh, so that um, we can plan for those. That's it from finance. Thank you, Mark. Um, policy, Ellen is not here and neither is Sherry, so guess what, Dan? Do you, <laughs> would you like to highlight anything from the meeting? Um, really? There's, there isn't anything significant to report other than there's been significant work done. This, this continued transition um, that we've been in the midst of while doing the, the annual policy review is, is lengthy, is detailed, is tedious, and is moving forward as best as we can. Uh, a number of us, uh, from Dan to Sherry, myself, have been participating in meetings along with FMTA representatives. Uh, the Education Foundation is struggling right now to have membership and trustees, and 
there's a big concern that uh, they may be losing senior leadership uh, and is just as all of us are pulled in different directions. So they're trying to recruit members or they may very well have to go dormant as they did uh, prior to 2016 uh, for a number of years. So I know they want to keep things moving forward, but it's a real struggle that many hands make light work and right now there are not appearing to be many hands. Those few people that are still with the foundation or redoubled their efforts, but uh, eventually I think it is reaching a breaking point. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just echo in on that real quickly. Um, the, the core people that continue to run the FM Ed Foundation are the same people that were present when it was brought out of its dormant state um, quite a number of years ago now and have, have put in an incredible amount of work and over, I, I think it's closing in on $50,000 of grants have been awarded to our teachers across the district um, since it was brought back out. Um, it, it has a significant balance and there's funding available to do a great many things, um, but it requires people. And, you know, COVID has certainly not helped with people's time and ability and, and fundraising has been challenged as well. Um, most of the events have had to be canceled or significantly postponed, but, but it is in need of some good people who have some great time on their hands and energy to do the great work that that foundation is able to do. You know, ultimately that foundation exists to fund projects for our teachers, for the benefit of our students. So I know so many people are so highly invested in their, their HSAs, um, but that is again, another organization that, that you know, funds and touches on educational opportunities for our teachers and students at every one of our buildings. And so, you know, throughout the community, if there's anybody interested in learning more about that, I would highly encourage uh, them to get in touch with Seth Jolly, who's the current president, so he can talk to them about opportunities. And, and it really is broken up and pretty uh, set up so that you, know, you can be involved and have a great impact without having to spend a great number of hours. Um, so for anybody in the community that is listening and may be interested in a place to get involved uh, where there can be great benefit to this district, that would be a great place to have a look at. Thank you. Um, as I said earlier, our legislative liaison is in the NISBA annual meeting virtually at the moment. She just texted me, it's almost done, so she may just make it here before we adjourn. Oh, and now our student board member, Hannah, with your first report. Welcome. And thank you very much. Hannah spent, what was it, an hour and a half meeting with me to get our board orientation done. So thank you very much, Hannah. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so most of the topics that I wanted to talk about tonight actually correlate with um, what Dr. Kilmer said in his building plan earlier this evening. So um, basically the welcoming back of students to the high school, we started with um, the Link Crew Day, which were um, mostly juniors and seniors who signed up to be Link Crew leaders and it was the welcoming of the freshmen, which was a really great um, day that we got back this year because unfortunately last year it was uh, very short and it was restricted obviously because of the pandemic. So I know a lot of students at the high school felt like it was a really great day to be able to introduce themselves to the freshmen and show them around and um, talking to some of the upperclassmen. They believe that being able to incorporate Link Crew throughout the year would help uh, the freshmen like grow at the high school and also be able to get involved in more events because um, as I said, it's only just one day with the freshmen and if you don't specifically reach out to them, they could get lost in the shuffle, which is something we don't want to happen. And then um, the overall consensus at the high school is many students are very grateful to be able to be back five days a week and um, that some of the social distancing guidelines have become less restrictive and they enjoy the wellness period that has been added to all of our schedules, which is either at the beginning or the end of our fifth period. Um, it's a time while the weather is nice, we all get to go outside and eat and talk with our friends. And, 
being able to have that 20 minute break of taking our masks off. I know a lot of students have enjoyed that and they're hoping, especially the underclassmen of who I've spoken to as the freshmen and the sophomores, they hope it's something that'll continue to stay in the schedule for years to come. Um, another thing is students were really grateful that uh, sporting events came back. That's always been a big thing at the high school. So we had our homecoming two weeks ago which uh, the class officers helped organize for homecoming floats. And I know like overall school spirit has definitely increased over the past 18 months. Like from when the time I was a freshman to now being a senior, I noticed like our school spirit that entire week, it included freshmen all the way to seniors. And we also had a handball tournament in, in replacement of the homecoming dance. And we ended up having 25 teams on the turf, which was an amazing turnout. Where in years previous, we only had 10 to 12 teams. So you could see like students want to get back to having activities, being together as um, a whole community and having the ability to have these tournaments outside now while the weather is nice, it gave uh, us the ability to have multiple like numerous teams while social distancing and just having that space on the turf to be able to be outside and be with your friends. It was something that uh, everyone looked forward to and it ended up being a really great event. Um, the senior class also had our uh, senior kickoff event, which was in replacement of our prom that was canceled in the spring due to just like the uncertainty of COVID and not being able to fundraise throughout the whole year. So we ended up having 152 seniors show up, which is a pretty decent number because our class is 323 students. So we felt that, you know, we were able to get almost like half of the class show up to this event and um, raise money for our ball. And it was just something great for all of us to do. And uh, spend time outside with having snacks, lawn games, and music. Um, and then, so far talking to students, there's just been a very positive um, feedback of being in school, not having, fortunately not having to do any Google Meets for those students who are able to be in school, and just the ability um, to have a lot of class discussions. That's one of the, uh, the feedbacks I've gotten back. So even though Dr. Kilmer um, stated that our scheduling for our classes is short of a 40 minute period, I know um, there's been a lot of class discussions more recently in uh, more of the humanities courses. And I think that's really um, something that students have become more grateful for. I know in one of my um, AP comparative government classes, we spend multiple classes just discussing what students want to discuss. It's a very like discussion-based class and all the students in the class can voice their own, um, own opinion on certain issues. So I think uh, they're appreciative of that. But as Dr. Kilmer said, like the 40 minutes does fly by. So maybe possibly looking in the future to extend having fewer classes, but longer periods could potentially be helpful. And then the last um, topic I wanted to bring up tonight was in regards uh, to the mental health initiative because it is something that is being widely discussed by the student body at the high school and especially in our community. And I just wanted to say that I talked to um, numerous stu students throughout the past two weeks in all grades, grade levels, mostly juniors and seniors, just because it's, it was easier in my own schedule to reach out and speak to them, and I'm more familiar with them, but um, students feel, there's a split between students who feel that there are enough resources available at the high school where, uh, regarding mental health issues, and they feel that they could go to their counselors. They become familiar with their counselors after being there for two, three years, and they feel like the resources we have at FM are very helpful. But then there are also some students who feel that um, they don't know what resources are avail available to them in regards to mental health. So I think that is one point where um, it would be very helpful to students if 
uh, more resources became available, even just of them learning where to go to um, the school psychologist or even, uh, I know, like the liaison um, and counselors and getting rid of like the idea that they're academic counselors and not just just academic counselors and they're there to support you mental health as well. I think if that got expressed to the student body as well, that would definitely help with some of the tensions right now regarding those issues. So that is everything I had for the student report. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. All right, any questions at all? So I think what I'm hearing you say, Hannah, is that students Many students just don't have the awareness of who and where, right? Where do you find a psychologist right in our building? Yeah, so the one thing I got back with feedback wasn't that they felt FM lacked uh, mental health resources. It was they felt that there wasn't, um, like, the ability to, like, reach out for it because... Uh, one suggestion I received was at the beginning of a school year having some sort of assembly or PowerPoint or letter that went out to students saying if you are in need of any mental health um, or you want to go speak to someone, if there was like some type of way to get this information to the students, I think that would be very helpful for them because I think that that's the one area that um, the student body felt was lacking was the ability to know what the resources were available to them. I, I just want to echo one piece. So Hannah, thank you for that. And, and, and I think two of the things that you talked about tie in very much together. One is the school spirit and one is the mental health side. Because I think we all know and we've talked about it a lot that one of the, the, the most detrimental things to our students in, in prior to this year was the isolation when we were remote. And um, I, I've had the opportunity to be at many of these events. That handball tournament was through the roof. It was awesome. Um, but at all the athletic events, I, I've talked to a lot of parents that and I know at a lot of other districts. And when, when our district rolls in or they come into our district right now, they're blown away by what's going on at these events with our students turning out. They just want to be together. And they're craving those opportunities. So. To go back, Dr. Tice, to what you were talking about before, as you look at indoor spectator things, I, I just want to ask that you keep that in mind, that these kids want to be together with their classmates. So whatever we can do as a district to accommodate that at, to the greatest extent possible is, is just really vital to, to these students and, and really to their mental well-being right now. Um, one thing I want to add um, is even the difference between, like, for example, today I had PE, and the difference between last year of only having the ability to walk around the track for our 40-minute gym period to today, even though it was a rainy day, we were able to be in house two gym, and we were playing a game of all of us together. You could completely tell it was a different atmosphere from just being alone, walking and isolated to being able to participate in a team sport. And it was a class of freshmen and sophomores playing against juniors and seniors. And I've just never seen a more like positive, like 40 minute class period, no matter how competitive everyone was. I think everyone was just so grateful to have those like team sports together again, even like as funny as it sounds, it just, so helpful to all our students. One thing I'd, I'd be interested in hearing in a future report is ways that students feel that we can get there other than you, because you can't talk to everybody. You want to, it's a fantastic report. But how do students feel that we can improve student voice in our district, us hearing from students about different issues? And we have a lot of uh, minority groups of students whether it's students uh, from you know, their um, sexual orientation or their race or um, religious, whatever. Um, how, I'd be interested in hearing um, like what some of those groups of students feel, as far, especially as far as mental health. Like are there spe um, specific services that can support um, those groups that they are looking for information about? And um, you know, what do they feel are some of the services that are more helpful to them? 
So I really, those two things, you know, how can we improve our students, our engagement with our students as far as hearing their voices, and then these different um, groups of students who may not always um, be at the table, what um, services do they feel that they need as, uh, from us as a district? Thank you very much for a great report, appreciate it. Okay. Next on the agenda, item 3.01, approval of the minutes from September 13th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from the September 13th Board of Education meeting? Thank you, Rebecca, second from Daryl. Any discussion? Yeah, just two things. Um, one is in section 4.03, um, Sherry had gone through the NISPA resolutions with us during that meeting. And as I understood it, the board authorized Sherry to act on behalf of the board with respect to those resolutions or certain of those resolutions. Uh, which is obviously where she is and what she's doing tonight. Um, I just think that it would be appropriate if the board is authorizing somebody to act for the board in a voting matter that we identify in the minutes which resolutions we have authorized that person to vote for or against. Um, so if we could add those into that, um, that would be very helpful. And the second is uh, 5.07. I wrote to all of you after this meeting. Um, I, I don't think that, I think from the process perspective, 5.07 is accurate, although the process itself was not. Um, but the resolution that was, um, that's reflected in the draft minutes um, is, is not the one that was voted on um, because there was a motion and a second to approved this district welcoming statement as presented. It was then during discussion, there was a proposal to amend it. There was never a motion or a second to amend it. And then there was a vote. So the vote was actually on the original version that was presented, not on the amended version. Um, so I, I don't think that the minutes on that section accurately reflect what was actually voted on or approved. So to your first point, we certainly can add um, the language in about which motions, I'm sorry, which of the resolutions the board asked Sherry to approve. In regards to the welcome statements, my understanding we approved the amended statement, which I'm trying to find it now, changed it to individuals, I believe, as opposed to racial and religious. So that's my understanding of what we improve. I understand you um, have concerns about the process that we followed, um, but I do believe that's what we've, that's my understanding is that's what we approved. So I just, what's there is what was discussed as the edit to it, but the motion and the second was to approve the district welcome statement as presented. If there's then an edit to what's going to be approved or not approved, as a matter of process, that would require another motion and second, and that never happened. So the district welcome statement that is in these minutes was not ever properly voted on or approved. So what I would say to that then is, I'm gonna go try, let me get to the right spots was the one second, let me get to where it was. Five point, hold on, I've got all my tabs open. Maybe it is a good idea that I stop opening so many tabs. One second. Uh, this was September 13th. Uh, so the difference in the two statements is the change from individuals I'm sorry, from, there were two different groups that were specified and there was some board discussion about changing those um, that we didn't want to, we wanted to make sure that no one felt left out. And so that's why there was a suggestion made to change it to individuals. Uh, again, hold on one second, I'm trying to get to the right. I'm sorry, what was that, Daryl, 5.0? 5.07. 5.07. 
So, okay, the Fayetteville Mainly Central School District is committed to creating a collaborative learning environment where all members feel included, respected, valued, and connected by affirming racial, I'm sorry, affirming individual identities, fostering relationships, and recognizing diversity as an asset for teaching and learning. So if I recall correctly, the prior language was racial and religious, correct? Is that what it was? Was it racial and religious? Does anyone remember? Is it in the minute somewhere? Sarah, was it racial and religious? Was it racial, just racial? Let's take a look real quick and make sure what it was. Well, what I'm gonna say is, I have no problem with adopting that original statement. If the process wasn't followed and that's what you're telling me was improved, the original statement, I'm good with approving that. I'm, I'm good with changing that in the minutes to reflect the original statement. I'm, my I'm point, happy to do that for you. My point is not the content of oh. this because I had asked that that be changed mm -hmm. from what was presented. My point is merely the process. The, the board, when this board voted on it, I understand, I can't speak for everybody else here, but I think everybody understood that they were voting on it as amended during discussion. My point simply is to vote on something that is amended during discussion requires a new motion and a second. So just from a simple process perspective, we've done that all the time when we make a motion, then we have a discussion, somebody comes up with a change or something else, we have a new motion, we have a new second, that just wasn't done in that instance. So, so what do you suggest that, we do, Dan? In the future, we should make well, sure we follow I, I don't think process. it's in, in the, the future. I think that right now we're just talking about the minutes. Mm -hmm. The minutes from, a, from what actually happened mm -hmm reflect it other than what was approved. Mm -hmm. What I think the problem is, is that from a legal technical perspective, the wrong one was approved. It's not the one that's stated in the minutes. So what should happen, Daryl, to your point, is, is outside of this current agenda item of, of just minutes approval, is that there should be an agenda item where somebody moves and seconds to adopt the district welcoming statement as it had been amended, which is what's reflected in these minutes. So that would be in tonight's minutes, correct? I, that would that could be done okay. tonight on. If so just to be clear, suggested. your only your only question or concern is that we just go back and vote to approve the amended version. That's your only I, concern. I think the minutes should be corrected so that they say that what was actually approved was as presented, not the amended, which is not as I understood it. What most of this board wanted to see there. Well, I and think then we tonight should reflect there that should well. be a vote mm -hmm. and a second to actually approve the correct edited version of it. So I think in the minutes it should reflect, I mean, I understand your interpretation of what we did approve, and we certainly can change the minutes to reflect that there was some, there was some confusion as to which one was approved. Um, Normally that needs to be done at the meeting where the issue is raised. The vote needs to be discussed and challenged at that particular meeting. However, I think the greater issue here is making sure our welcome statement is approved and we're ready to move forward and not keep going back to that particular issue. So we can amend the agenda. And, and the reason it wasn't done at that meeting was you cut me off. I That's why it didn't happen then. I called for, I asked, I called the question because there had been quite a bit of discussion. Um, in your follow-up email, you um, referenced a personal agenda. Uh, I'm not sure what you meant by that, but I will say I do have a personal agenda in approving a welcome statement for our district. And we did have discussion and it was seven to two. So when you say I cut you off, I individually cannot do anything unless I have a majority of the board voting in support of that. So let's be clear there. I do but, not. But you did not. Second, but you did Daniel, not do. You did not do Daniel, that, Marissa. One second, please. You did not do that. Dan, one second. So I called the question, and then there was a vote. I did not say we're going to approve this. It was a. There was a vote of seven to two, 
Now, to wrap this up, because we have a lot more to get to, uh, we can amend the agenda this evening to approve the amended language. As for clean up these minutes, I think we should table these minutes and um, look at them again to make sure that they are actually reflected as to what happened. I don't think we're gonna resolve that particular issue tonight, so we can table these minutes to the next meeting and just approve the revised agenda as a action item in a few minutes after I get through the other minutes. Is the board okay with that? Is that good, Dan? That would be a motion to table them that somebody would second so that we don't have a repeat of the same problem we're talking about now. Okay. I'll let you make that motion so that- That's yours, it's, so it's, go right it's ahead. It's been done correctly. That's yours, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you for, no. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so, um, all right, so a motion then to table the minutes um, and then a motion to amend the agenda as well um, to add item, let's do that as, uh, I think that would be 7.01 and turning executive session into 7.02, is that correct, Sarah? Right, I was gonna put it, before, I was gonna move executive session down, but I can make it item 8.01. 8. All right, so we'll make the vote to admit, uh, sorry, amend 8.01 and then personnel is 8.02. Any questions before we vote about the amendment or the motion, I'm sorry? The motion, all right, so. Motions. One was to table, one was to amend the Any agenda. questions about either motion? Is that correctly formed? Are we good with that before I'll, we vote? I, I'll do the motion on the second thing we just talked about. To so. separate them, you mean? You want I made it one I made it into one motion, but motions, I have no right? problem with separating this. We'll move it along. Let's do two. Let's be safe. Okay. So first, first motion then is to table the September 13 minutes. And thank you, Jason. And a second from um, Mark, any discussion on tabling the minutes? All those in favor, please raise your hand and indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, next motion is to move to add to the agenda item 8.02, which is going to be amending the, um, the welcome statement. Thank you, Kelly, and a second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, perfect. Now we will move on to the September 20th special meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the September 20th meeting minutes as presented? Thank you, Jason, and a second from Daryl. Any discussion of those minutes? All in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Next item, I'm sorry, 3.03, .03, the October 4th special meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Thank you, Daryl, and a second from Kelly. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you, Mark, one abstention. All right, so 3.04 we moved. Next would be the budget calendar. Is there a motion of the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District hereby approve the 2022-23 budget calendar as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Thank you, Jason. Discussion of the budget calendar. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Next item 3.06, annual policy review. Is there a motion that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District has completed their annual policy review and hereby moves the revised policies 1110, 1900, and 5210 into second reading at the next possible board meeting? Is there a motion? Thank you, Dan, and a second from Mark. Any discussion? So this is not, this is on the others that we reviewed. And I know I read in the policy minutes, I know there's two folks missing here, um, but I did notice that we still kept in a couple of gendered pronouns in the policy 1530, the minutes, and from what I read in the 
report from, I think, two policy committees ago. There was apparently some discussion about waiting until we had a DEI policy before we did that. And I just think there's, there's a lot of, there are a lot of issues that are to come out. And I don't know that this is something that would specifically be listed in a policy. So to me, again, when we're talking about policies, there, there's no reason for there to be a gender in any policy. These are professional positions that are listed. And, you know, the one in question is very easily you could replace that with the actual position that it's referring to. And I don't even think it sounds that awkward. So again, I'd, I think that was the only one in this group that I saw, but I, I think we agreed as a board that we were gonna do that going forward. So I would like to see that change. We did make that agreement. I noticed that in the minutes too, that there was discussion at the policy committee meeting about not removing gender pronouns until after there was a DEI policy, but the board did agree to do that. And I think we need to honor that and remove those gender pronouns from our policy. Dan, do you have any feedback? I think you were at that meeting. Yeah, there, there, was, there was definitely discussion about it and, and the fact that some of them are very simple and easy changes and some of them are, are far less simple and easy changes and on things that everybody on the policy committee recognizes um, would be changed, uh, but the expectation when we had that discussion um, about pronouns in policies was also at a time when we were expecting that we were going to be much further along, if not already having this DEI policy completed that went back to administrative review and we didn't get eyes back on it until our just our most recent policy meeting last week, which came back as three different versions um, from the administration administrative team, not one, and so that the there wasn't clarity among the policy committee on where and what direction that was taking. And there are we're working from multiple sets of these policies because we have the existing, we have uh, the new NISBA versions that we're trying to convert across to, and there there there's a there's a just a fundamental. Um, organizational and, and forget just, you know, um, as a matter of policy, just, just from an organizational clarity thing of, of where and when this cutoff is gonna be made that that change gets made, where it, it, we end up with very inconsistent policies that some have it, some don't. And so the discussion was that we were tracking all of those that needed to be made and that if we can get this DEI policy completed, that we had the expectation that would have been completed many, many months ago, then those can be made in one general sweeping approval at that point in time, um, as opposed to just haphazard as we're, as we're getting to them. Um, so that's the discussion that we had. Obviously, you know, it's, the, it's not a decision that the policy committee merely makes recommendations. That was the recommendation of the committee was to hold them until we make that one sweeping change across those that Sarah was tracking. Um, that was the recommendation that came out of policy. I'm confused. Aren't we just taking gender pronouns? It doesn't matter what version of the policy we're looking at. We're just saying there should be no gender, policy, gender pronouns in there. So it doesn't matter what version, every single version, every single policy is gonna have a removed. So I don't see why it's confusing. Why is it confusing? I tried to come to policy. Remember, Dan? It didn't work out too well. <laughs> when we're doing policy review, policy review, if we're not making changes, doesn't require a change to policy, so it's not a first reading, second reading. Policy changes are all first review, are all first reading, second reading. So we can get into first reading, second reading on every single policy individually as we go forward at every single meeting, or we can make and store and track those changes, make them all in one and put it all forward in, in one bucket. I don't wanna wait one more minute to, take, to make sure to follow through with the will of the board on this and remove these gender pronouns. I don't see any reason to warehouse this and, and stockpile pronouns waiting for us to do it in one clean sweep. I have no problem with adding these to each agenda and cleaning them up. Kelly, you were gonna say something? No, I don't, I don't wanna 
talk again if anyone else has something to say. I just think it, it almost seems like more efficient to do it this way. I mean, if, if that means we have to pull a policy from, you know, from this group that we're not, you know, and we need to put that into even a first, on a first reading or a second, I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's, we're literally talking about changing like four words. So I think it, you know, as we identify, it might be easier than going through the entire manual and looking for all of that all at once just seems like really daunting. So I'd rather just catch it now and maybe, you know, I, I don't know, that's just my, my thought. My, my point was that they are being caught now. They just weren't being put forward to first and second reading now. Are there any gender pronouns that we missed in the ones here, Kelly? Which one had the gender pronoun that wasn't removed? 1530. 1530. So we can go to fifth. So we've got like eight here, and there's just that one, 1530. And I'm just going to it real quickly. Does anyone know? So I don't have to. Oh, here it is. His or her designee. Is that the one? It's that second sentence actually has both of them. So it so could either would, easily be replaced with clerk and then superintendent in both of those. Okay. Does it require a motion, a second, and a vote to make this? Well, we have to, we'd have to vote to approve the amended policy with the, the policy with those changes in there. So his, her becomes, the first one becomes um, clerk, and the second one becomes superintendent. I, I understand that, but I mean going forward so that it's done as we review and pass. Yeah, for every one of them, it's a policy change. So it's first reading, second reading, yes. I think we can look into approving them in one motion as well. One thing I've noticed at our BOCES meetings is we, we, we clear out a lot of um, items on the agenda by grouping together the items and voting instead of doing individual items. And um, so maybe that's something we can look into to clean up so that there isn't that list of, that long list. And also if we can do that with like, so I'm not reading the whole resolutions, that'd be great too. Um, all right, so for this one, what I, is there any other comment from the board? Or any thoughts from the board about this? Yeah, I respect the work of the policy committee. It is a lot of work. So I understand the process of maybe a, a different preference to do thing in, things in batches. Um, I personally feel like this is low hanging fruit that we can start to make an impact now. And so much of the other work just takes time because we are working with multiple stakeholders and multiple, and it's just, um, it just has to follow the process. But this is something that we can do that can have some impact now. So I would prefer to move forward as we'd agreed. <laughs> okay, so. Sorry. The motion is to move the revised policies into second reading. So 1530, is that in first reading? Oh. It's in neither. So we'll just pull that back and bring that back to, it's, it's, it's neither in first nor in second. The only ones that are, in, are, are before the board currently tonight in this motion are 1911.10 and 52.10. But I think it should be made clear the board would like those pronouns removed. We, we, I, and I, then it will be brought back at the next meeting. Got okay. that. So um, I believe I had a first and second for the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Actually, I'll abstain because I didn't hear what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Distrust us. <laughs> um, let's see. Ah, 3.07. Board and district or slash superintendent goals. Um, I think we're actually, well, we're not too far off schedule. So at this point, um, we do not, we um, do not, we are going to approve, I'm sorry, or discuss new goals for the district um, superintendent and the board. So we have our previous board goals and we have prior goals that we gave to Craig. So do we want to start with superintendent or do we want to start with board? Well, I just want to clarify, like, was we mean district goals because Right, board versus district, not board versus superintendent. And superintendent. Well, this is a conversation we always get into. I know, right? <laughs> so, and that's well, why I purposely kind of superintendent said. says to me like based on evaluation. Uh -huh. District says to me like what are the broader district goals like we talked about mm -hmm. last year, like the school start study and opening the buildings and all mm -hmm. that. 
I am okay with whatever the board wants to do. I just remember that last year we had a really lengthy discussion about it. So that's why I kind of used both, but I'm open to however we want to do it. I just want to move into the meat of it, which is the actual goals that we need to come up with this evening. So if anyone has a clean way they'd like to do it, I'm more than willing to go along with that. So I'm I believe Dr. Tice gave us a draft of what he thinks our district or superintendent goals should be. Um, are they, I don't know if they're attached here, but um, since we already have that, um, since we already have that, I think that might be a good place to start since they're drafted. And you know what, it starts with the superintendent of schools will, so. I just put it in executive time, Tom. Just refresh. Board docs. Well, while we're doing that, though, I thought we also had made some progress towards talking about board goals. Was there some, I thought there was some work, is, or do you have some notes that we can work off of? Uh, all my notes have is that it's last year's, we didn't finish either of them, so we discussed that those are very logical board goals. I don't think we drafted anything in general. So last year's board goals were, uh, does everyone have a copy of those? We can start with the district. The district, okay. Do you, do you remember differently? I don't remember drafting, but I do remember discussing where we were headed that we already had a, yeah. I think what we discussed is that they're so similar to last year that we don't have to make any, anything new. It's just updating last year. Okay, so Dr. Tice, thank you for adding that. So he has three in here. Um, let's see, I'll read them for the sake of the audience. The superintendent of schools will continue to make progress on the New York State Ed Board of Regents culturally responsive sustaining education framework, DEI initiative, beginning with an overview of the four principles. One, welcome, welcoming and affirming environment. Two, high expectations and rigorous instruction. Three, inclusive curriculum and assessment. And four, ongoing professional learning and supported by study groups at both national there's a word missing in there somewhere. Um, national learning and national and local uh, levels. So this goal is centered around. Well, this is a DEI goal. I would count. I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, one piece of feedback that I'm hearing from people is they'd like like some very specific action items associated with each with our goals. So are there specific things that you were <coughs> thinking of in terms of this particular goal? Certainly, I mean, we've said to educate ourselves um, before we just rush in to make changes. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, the OCM BOCES is taking our idea, I think, and trying to allow George Theo Harris and his book in terms of five, practice, five practices for equity Focus schools to allow it to be a conversation that occurs throughout central New York. So I know all of you have a copy of that book already. Uh, the other book, uh, if I may, is uh, from AASA. Uh, this was Tim Shriver. Uh, you have a copy of that now. Our other group uh, that is working with AASA is taking a look at the call to unite. It's about uh, taking a look at it from an inclusion perspective. I think when a lot of people hear DEI, they focus on race as the only diversity, and it's important to take a look at other things that what brings us together rather than what separates us. So I think the inclusionary perspective from uh, Tim Shriver, a lot of you know his mother was Eunice Kennedy Shriver who founded the Special Olympics. He is the CEO of the Special Olympics, and uh, I had the pleasure of hearing him speak at one of the more recent AASA uh, functions. So. Being able to, I think, educate ourselves is the first action step. You heard a little of it tonight as we begin to take a look at library media center audits and things like that. There's things we can do behind the scenes, but I think we need to better understand what are the expectations as we go forward. So 
right now, to me, it's doing our due diligence to understand the issue before we just jump in and start making changes. Under um, professional learning, maybe this is not the place where it would be, but we've had some pushback um, from the community towards faculty in regards to different things that are being taught. And I don't know what this would look like, but I think there needs to be some clarity provided to staff and the community as far as you know, what are the, not the rules, but you know, our, our faculty is, they're, they're very um, professional and they're teaching our students pretty much what they've been do doing for a very long time. But now we're seeing posts on social media, we're seeing, you know, there's um, people, uh, they're under a microscope, I guess I would say. So I don't know if we need training, like, or an understanding for our staff as far as like what our expectations are and what and how we're going to be supportive of them and maybe some education from the community. But I think that's a gap there. I think there's a gap there personally that we need to address. And I'm not sure if that's how that looks, but I think under that particular goal, that's something that we should look at. Well, our, one should. of our new one of our new favorite that's sayings is we don't want to get out ahead of our skis. Did I say that the right way? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think we need to better understand the issue. So I think mm -hmm. there are some faculty that are well-intended, and uh, you're right, there may be posts on social media that we are getting out ahead of our skis. I mean, I think the important thing is, is we better understand it as administrators. I know District Curriculum Council is starting to investigate the issue. Uh, they're having the discussions in the buildings. I just think we need to have that background training. We can't get out ahead of our skis. It doesn't mean it's not worthwhile work. It doesn't mean it's not important work, not to use double negatives, but we just cannot you know, rush in where angels fear to tread. I think we've got to do our homework first to better understand it. So I think it would be helpful for the goal to be a little bit more <coughs> action-oriented to what that means to educate ourselves. because. It sounds like there's a lot of work already starting on the audit, on the framework in the, in, at the building level, um, some work for professional development, some maybe board training. How are we unifying what we're learning and what we're doing so we're all on the same page? Because to me, this, uh, these four principles, like I don't even know, I, I don't, I'd like to know what they, like where, where do we start at the ground level and, and build up? So is there someone that could train us on these, um, on these pieces for specifically for the, for the Board of Regents expectations? That sounds like the administrators are very schooled and these are, understand these issues already, but we as a board, I feel like I don't, other than reading the PDF we got last year, I'm not super informed yet. And we're trying to set that up for the retreats coming forward. Nothing's been finalized at this point, but we're trying to give the board some of that background. So again, these are 30,000 foot view goals here. I mean, if the board is looking for a punch list of specificity, we can work that up. But this was trying to just approach it from that 30,000 foot view. Oh, I just, so, I just I, I'm sorry. I just feel like we're, we go in this circle like every two, two and a half years of, of what goals should look like. And we, we had a very lengthy series of discussions about ensuring that when we did goal setting that we did smart goals. So something that was specific and measurable and achievable and relevant and time bound. And, and I, I, I couldn't, I, I look at these and I, I don't honestly see any of that other than relevant in here. So you know, I, I like the theories of these items that are listed here, but, but they have to be more specific of what is going to be done, what, what the actual expectation in what time frame, and, and how do we measure whether it's attained or not. And I just look at something that says continue to make progress on something is not specific, time-bound, measurable, 
You need that as much as we do. I mean, for you to come to us and say, I met my goal. You need to know what did you need to do to meet that goal. Your, your idea of that may be very different than ours based on you know, something that's set forth this way. So, you know, I, 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 I think it's a great concept, but you know, I, we, we have to find the path to take this to SMART goals. And you heard some SMART goals tonight from the building action plans, and I have developed SMART goals in the past. These are 30,000 foot view goals. I mean, if the board wants to get into the weeds, and that's certainly the pleasure of the board, we, I can bring SMART goals back. But the question is, what is the direction? What is the target? saying we seem to just kind of circle this every two, two and a half years that we go smart goals, 30,000 foot goals, smart goals. 30, so I, I, I thought we had settled on smart goals. If this board feels differently, then, you know, that's that's remains to be heard. I thought that's the direction we had agreed that we were going to be in so that when it's your goals and we get to a mid-year or a year-end to talk about, you know, were these achieved or were they not, we have a way to actually have that discussion. And you have the strategic plan and you have the annual report and the posters that's there lists the four priority areas. The buildings built their goals off of those priority areas, as you heard tonight. So the question is, what is our compass? Just the strategic plan? Well, we don't need to do any of these. I mean, we're, I guess what I'm wrestling with is what is the context? So to me, these are contextual goals. That is, we do our life's work. Should we be paying attention to DEI issues, for example? So to me, these 30,000 foot view isn't good or bad compared to SMART goals. To me, this provides the context on why we do the SMART goals. I think, Dr. Tice, with this first one, I'm not hearing anyone not supportive of this particular goal. I think what we need you to come back with is a couple of different specific items that we're going to do over the, or you're going to do over the next year under this. So if we call this the, the framework for that goal or the, the $20,000, $20,000, 20,000 foot view, or 30,000 foot view, whatever you were saying, then under that view, at least uh, two or three specific things that we're going to do. So welcoming and affirming environment. What specifically are we going to, you're going to do towards, <laughs> towards that particular item? So I think this, I believe everybody's good with. Well, we just want a couple of very specific things that are going to occur under that. Just and that would be the measurable thing. By. Yeah, and that would be the measurable thing. So that's what I think you should come back with. So I think, I know we've talked about this like a ton of times, and I, I, I think we've discussed how some of these maybe would span years, right? I know we've talked about that before. I do think it's, I, I guess, I mean, we, we heard these great presentations and we have like the strategic plan, like why are we not just evaluating against that every year. Like, it seems like we keep trying to come up with like different goals, but any major initiative we have, and honestly, the way I look at these are kind of initiatives, like things that we're gonna focus on, but our they should be reflected in our strategic plan, and then we should be measuring against the plan to the extent that we, you know, to whatever degree we need to do that at a district level, and maybe we need to, you know, maybe we need you, Craig, to drill down and to make something a smart goal that's related to something that's already there. But it seems like I don't, I don't want to reinvent what's already been there. And maybe we have to just start the cycle again, like before the next, you know, plan on a page gets developed or as it's getting developed, we decide, you know, that everything needs to be aligned. Like, you know, the DEI stuff and, and certainly long range, you know, facilities planning and, I mean, I think that's already part of the plan. So if we already have something, we've already, we already have ways of tracking what's happening, then it seems to me like that should be the framework. I concur. I mean, I, I think in terms of the DEI, for example, for those of you that remember the strategic planning 
binder, and I've provided updates in the past, mm -hmm. in terms of Deming's plan do study act cycle, we are in the fifth year of it, if you go to your fifth tab, which means to look at the mission and vision again. So as an administrative cabinet, we've already had discussions, which I believe I've shared with the board. I know you spent a lot of time on the welcoming statement in terms of the process tonight, but one of the things that the cabinet talked about is the importance of the welcoming statement, then being the first paragraph of the new DEI policy, which I think is important. And then the last part is, should not a couple of words be inserted into the new mission statement to memorialize that in the next iteration? So if you, I'm happy to lay that kind of detail out. And to me, those are the goals as developing to your point. And again, this is just an example based on the first bullet, but there's the plan. Get the welcoming statement in. Make sure the welcoming statement's the first paragraph of the DEI policy. And then finally, modify the mission statement to include a sentence fragment that addresses our commitment to DEI. Because if we don't memorialize it, it won't have the sustainability going forward, which will be measured, to Kelly's point, in the future plan on a page, you know. And so I just think where we're looking to merge vision, mission, priority areas, that is what will memorialize it. And we all laid that out as a governance team what is it now? Five years ago, when we first started the PDSA cycle, believe it or not, folks, we're up to dusting off the vision and mission this year. Sarah wants to hear that. All the posters we created now, <laughs> now <laughs> taking a look at the mission and vision, and uh, mission and vision, and I don't think it's going to change dramatically. But this is our chance to tweak it, not to put it on a wall not to wait a decade or more before we alter it again, but do we still believe in that going forward? So I agree. I mean, tonight's presentation and the articulation, it's, it, to me, is wonderful. I mean, that checks a lot of boxes right there. But that to, almost seems like a joint board district goal in and of its to revisit the mission and vision, you know, related to the DEI policy work that's going to happen. I mean, then the way that you described that, it sounds to me like the board goals are all tied to the strategic plan, but I'm sorry, the district goals are tied to the strategic plan and alignment with the strategic plan. But essentially, we're pulling out focus area, you're pulling out focus areas for the district within the strategic plan, like highlighting three areas as we're honing in on the strategic plan. And with that, it's just helpful to have the specificity. So we can, even if it's reiterating things that were in the action plans tonight as examples, it's helpful for us as, a, as we refresh and look back on the year to say, well, these, this is what we meant by each of these, you know, one, two, three, and four. So I think we're saying the same things it may just be presenting it in a different way that's pulling out what's already in the strategic plan and providing more examples and context. And again, these were my drafts for you to consider. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was better than starting with a blank easel. You know, I mean, feel yeah. free to well, mark them up, chalk them up. No, I mean, that, that is... This isn't trying to sell a bill of goods. This is, gives us time to edit and modify as we see fit. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like with, at the end of this year, we're going to look. We should be looking back at that, those strategic, the strategic plan, and everything that was presented, and see where we ended up. And you know, we might not hit it all, but you know, what does the progress look like? Where did we end up? what had to change because of some unforeseen thing or just, you know, new learning or whatever. But it seems like those are the things that we should be kind of measuring our progress against because they've already been so well vetted and, and thought out by, you know, everyone at the district. Just, just to skip ahead, you, you have three bullets on this document. 
if you take, if you look at the, the second bullet, you take the first sentence and split it into two sentences. Those are two very specific, measurable, achievable goals, as is the, the sentence that follows. I mean, and, and the third bullet is the same. I, I think there's, there's great specificity in, in each thing that's within the second two bullets. They just need to be, you know, a couple of the sentences need to be cut in half into two separate goals. I just, I just, I'm just missing that in the first bullet. So what I'm saying about trying to get these two, you know, detailed and measurable and achievable, I just, I don't, I wouldn't know how to measure success or accomplishment or where we should be come June off of the first bullet. Other thoughts from the board? Jason? So I, I, I would agree with that. I think the one thing that I also see that's still kind of missing in here for me um, is we're still in the middle of a pandemic. We're still dealing with COVID because we're still getting COVID updates at every board meeting that we have. So I think we need to have something in there um, related to that um, and really to build upon, um, you know, one of my suggestions would be is, is really, Hannah, this goes back to you and your senior class, whatever this board can do and whatever the superintendent and the administration can do to make sure that you guys have events, right? So. Big goal for me personally is make sure you guys all have a senior ball. You didn't get a junior prom, so we owe you a senior ball. Um, hopefully that's not outside under a tent. Um, it would be really nice to have it in a, a nice facility. And, and as a board member, I feel we owe that to you guys. So, you know, I'm not saying that needs to be the specific goal, but things like that, Craig, I, I think that we owe it to ourselves um, as a board to include that, you know, within Craig's goals this year. And I think to, um, you know, so far this year, the school has been great. We've done everything, you know, I think we've done everything we can so far to keep kids in school and keep activities going. Um, you know, it's definitely gonna be a challenge come this winter, I know that, but I, I think that we need to have that on, um, on your goals for this year. And I'll open it up to other board members, but I, I think it's important that we still keep that forefront and that that doesn't just fade away. So you, you mean like a broad goal that we'll continue to do everything we can to keep our schools open and safe for students so that they can have as many events as possible because there are so many outside factors that we can't, I mean, regulations and whatever. So not to specifically say we're going to be able to do X, Y, and Z for the students, but that we're going to create a climate where we're going to be able to do as much as we possibly can under whatever rules were operating it at that time. Right, and that we still continue to keep it to the forefront. I, I just, I feel like if we don't make it a goal, it'll get lost. So I, I think it still needs to be elevated to that level. It's still gotta be a goal for this year so we don't lose sight of that. Um, and top of the DEI work and the capital projects and everything else we have going on, I, I just think it's still important that we keep it there and keep it memorialized. The other thing we discussed in regards to um, COVID is getting, uh, having further discussions about the impact on student achievement um, and continuing to get that information as well. So I'm seeing like a more broader goal related to COVID. You know, it's, it's mean, uh, working towards that FM high standard in everything in, under this situation the best that we can considering how taxing it is, absolutely taxing it is on everybody and that there is a lot that we can't control. So how we're gonna wordsmith that, it'll be interesting, but I see where you're going with that. I think you could include mental health in that piece as well. So in a way, I think, I like your point, Jason, because I think this work's already being done, regardless of whether you make it a goal, but it clearly, it should be a goal, and it will be something we can report out on and hopefully be proud of at the end of the school year um, on all the, the really, like amazing work that was just done to, to make changes throughout the year to be flexible and reduce quarantines. Um, so I think that makes sense. And then to add in certainly student performance, but also student mental health in light of um, continuing to operate in a pandemic and the effects from remote and hybrid instruction last year. 
other thoughts from the board? So, and I'm going to save the wordsmithing too afterwards, but I'm seeing a goal related to uh, the well-being of our students academically and mentally um, and our, I think, our overall staff in terms of um, operating in a COVID pandemic situation. We can certainly wordsmith that out. And then I want to go back to what we were, going, what we were saying about pulling out goals from the strategic plan. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, what is our understanding for that piece? Everyone, well, make sure we're on the same page. Go ahead, Rebecca. I, don't, I think the second and third goals, to Dan's point, can kind of stand alone and possibly just be cleaned up and broken down by separating each sentence as kind of its own sub part of that goal. Mm -hmm. I think it's the first bullet here on the culturally responsive um, sustaining education framework that perhaps Craig could just take a stab at itemizing a little bit more and pulling in sure. from the strategic plan and we can kind of react to that because it's hard for us to know what's in his head and what, what makes sense in light of the plans that are ongoing. So then we have four goals. We have the COVID one, and then we're going to have him um, do a little more work on the first one and then keep the third and fourth goals. Well, I mean, these are the four that we're working with, and we're going to wordsmith those out. So it may be bullets, it may be separate items, but four headings, four headings that we're working with. Is everyone okay with that? Okay, great. We will wordsmith. All right, in terms of board goals, so we did have some discussion that we were not finished with our current board goals and that we needed, because actually the second one, the board will examine ways the district can promote a healthy climate when addressing student discipline and how restorative justice practices can be incorporated into policy in our code of conduct. I don't think we have any work on that one this year. And I think that's an important one, especially, and I think that's one we can get a lot of student voice involved. Um, so I'd like to see us Keep that one, what are everyone else's thoughts? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's important, especially now that, you know, I'm hearing at the building level talk about, you know, um, through the various activities that are being planned, a lot about peer-to-peer -peer kind of interaction and, and, you know, positive interaction. So I think, you know, certainly at least, you know, pieces of restorative justice involve peer-to-peer -peer mediation and, and things like that. So I think that, learning, you know, at least educating us as to, as to, you know, what that means and how that might relate to the code of contact, which, you know, hasn't, as, at least since I've been on the board, not really changed much. Um, I, so I'd, I'd personally like to keep that as a goal going forward. Everyone go with that? Okay, so circling back to the first one, the board will strive to better educate itself about diversity, equity, inclusion, and the impact of discrimination in the Fayetteville Mainly Central School District and engage in a board retreat and other discussions to evaluate how the board may support the district administration in further embracing acceptance and action against prejudice and discrimination of all forms. Um, I feel like that's a lot, <laughs> a lot said, but not a lot done. So I think I'd like to keep this broader goal, but put some items in here that we're actually going to do. Anyone, does anyone have any thoughts off the Yeah, I think we just, we agreed to come up with a DEI policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's our goal this year. And then we tie, we work with the district to tie that into the, you know, revamping or revising to whatever extent it is of the mission and vision statement. So developing a DEI policy tied into revamping the mission and vision statement. And again, we'll get the language. We also Freed have up. Our, our reading. Uh, we have at least two, two books. Oh, this that's year right. That we want to continue. And but, the training um, with Dr. Zio Harrison, his book. That's what I was going to say. That the BOCES uh, training will be. And the BOCES training. Okay. That is. So the DEI policy tied into the revised mission and vision statement, Dr. Zio Harris's training, and the BOCES training. I would just add that training is great, but I think we need to kind of move it into action. So mm -hmm. to the extent our administrators are, are doing the same trainings, um, even thinking about the restorative justice piece, I mean, we're not administrators. We're not really schooled and disciplined. So 
I don't think we can explore those issues and we can ex continue to learn on DEI, but I think, I think working with our administrators on brainstorming ways that we can support on the policy side and mm -hmm. we can support them on the action steps um, will be important because at a certain point, I think the community is gonna be really clamoring for more than just trainings. Mm -hmm. So in the book, and I can't remember what chapter it is in Dr. Theo Harris's book, I think it's four. That's where there's work done related to data, which is something the board wants to see. So that could be where we connect in with the administrators. I don't know what chapter they're on right now, or if that is the correct chapter, but one of those chapters focuses on data and having that information brought to the board um, to see what is it telling us about our school? Because I think we need that data to develop our action items, some of our action items anyway. But that is one of the chapters in that book. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just would ask one step further. I know we're talking about mass, ma more mass trainings with OCM BOCES, but do we have to do that? Could we have a training on the book with the authors, like that's customized to FM or with the administrator, like a, a discussion led by the authors with our administrative cabinet. I mean, I'll defer to Dr. Tyson, whatever he thinks makes sense, but I just, I'd like it to be more action oriented. So the goal with what Dr. Theo Harris has planned is the broad training for all boards, but then work done within the district, within each district. So giving the broader training to all the boards together, but then each district doing work with, um, within, its, you know, within itself to, on, on different issues. I think if we're at a put at a you know moving on to the next thing, Marissa, you mentioned that, and I have also heard that there's a I don't know if the word what, what you said it better than I can, but the we want to communicate to the teachers that we have their back in this in the culture out there with parents and speakers to the board. Uh, we want to say, you know, that, that teachers, you've been doing a great job. We have your back. And I don't know if that's, I think it got, when we were talking about district goals, that may have gotten left out, but that may be something that we could work into a board goal that they always know that we're doing this, you know, to help you. I don't know how to work it in or if we want to put it in here, but it's something you mentioned and I think it got left off our last discussion. Well, for me, it's more about, There needs to be something formalized or there needs to be more specific information about, um, you know, this is what our teachers do. And, you know, what happens when someone says, oh, this is, you know, you're, you're doing something wrong here, you know? And then also to, do we need more training for our teachers and having some, uh, discussions related to DEI issues when they are covering sensitive material in school. Is that a need? I don't know. But that's something I'd like to know if that's, you know, um, a support that we can provide. You know, it's, this is a climate where, you know, I mean, folks want cameras in classrooms now so that they can have that level of micromanagement of our educators. And I just feel like we haven't been very, and, and, and not, not finding fault with us, because this is also very new for all of us, but I think we need to really think about what our message is to our faculty about their teaching and um, how we're going to support them and what do they need from us as far as support. And that's something we're having conversations about now. I mean, as you know, we have invested heavily in curriculum maps. I mean, there's a lot of things that we do, and sometimes it's, you heard it tonight from one of the speakers to spark critical thinking. So we're using different documents and texts and sometimes they may be seen as controversial, but we're not trying to indoctrinate anybody. We're trying to help think big picture. And if you don't present sometimes diametrically opposing views and to try to tease out using conflict, um, so there, there's a, a, an intent behind what we do. So I think the trick is, is again, not to get out ahead of our skis, to stick to the cur curriculum maps. And if anybody challenges us um, on it, we can go back to the curriculum maps and point to the particular lesson or point to the particular objective and how it fits with the state standards. That's the safe ground. 
if we start improvising just because we have a passion for that, and again, get out ahead of our skis, that's where I think the problem comes in. So we may feel a call to action, but I think at the same time, we want to be true to the investment and the curriculum that we've put together. Doesn't mean it can't be revised, doesn't mean it can't be reviewed going forward. In fact, as you've heard tonight, that's our intent in a lot of areas, but at the same time, the safe ground is to do what we've been doing and we've been very successful at it for a long time. I think to me the, the, the bigger issue and other than saying we, we specifically support this group or this group, it, it's, it's just communication. You know, as I sit in each of these meetings and, and listen to comment that we receive that I, I'm, I'm more than happy to hear everybody's entitled to their own opinions and I, I value their feedback, but but I hear some people coming in and saying, well, you've already done X and you're down this pathway and this is what you're doing. And I sit here and say, well, I, I haven't been in any meeting where we've discussed what you're telling me we've decided. And on the, on the proverbial other side, we hear people saying, I want you to go faster and do more and give us more specifics about what you're doing. And, and to me, my, my, my biggest takeaway from all of that has been that intentionally or unintentionally, we've created a bit of a, a, a vacuum of information where people are filling in to that vacuum what they want to or presume to fill into that vacuum, but that may or may not be true or accurate. And, and so to me, if we're gonna address any type of a board goal in that capacity, it is to be more clear and more specific about what we have done and are doing at each step of the process of, you know, even if it's just, no, we have not done that. We have not addressed this. We have not talked about that. I'm sorry, I know that you think we have, but we have not. Just clarity of communication at each step through the district. I think we owe that not just to our faculty, but I think we owe that to the community because I think that there is a lot of confusion. I think that there's a lot of beliefs that are just inaccurate about what we have done or are doing or might do. I, I, I mean, I sit here when I listen to some of the things that, I, I, that we've been told that we've done and I'm just, I'm utterly perplexed because I've not been part of those discussions. So I, I just, to me, the board goal very specifically is to do our very best to communicate as clearly as we can with all stakeholders about what we're doing as we do it. If we're doing what? Anything. Whatever it is that we as an organization and a governing body may be addressing. I think that's a good point. However, I think we need to have a couple of things that we know we're going to be doing. Right? If we're going to make sure a goal of communicating clearly, then I think we need to be clear as to what we're going to communicate. Well, maybe, Marissa, it's something as simple as, and maybe this is this will come out with the DEI committee report too, but during your president's report, just making sure that you're reporting out on our progress towards our board goals. And now obviously, that's a little meta, like to report on our goal to be more clear. I don't know. But, but, I wouldn't um, even so make it a goal. I'd make it just something. I don't think it's, yeah, it it's goal-worthy. I think yeah, it's just I think it's, a, it's a principle yeah. or a guiding, you know, that we should always be trying to do to be as transparent and open as possible. Mm -hmm. but Similar like, to what we're doing with Dr. E, like we've made sure we've pulled out the COVID report and put that on the agenda. We can make sure that there's always something on the agenda where we're reporting very specifically about board goals on there. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I wouldn't make it a goal, but I would um, definitely add that as an item on the agenda, making sure we do that. I mean, to me, from a communication standpoint, we have meetings that are live streamed, which I fully support and they need to continue, but not everybody has hours to sit and watch them. We have meeting minutes that we all know are, are, are in appropriately very generic. You really can't glean very much from them about what was or wasn't discussed in the content and the, the, the spirit in which it was offered. That, that there's something that can be done that's between that, that's not reliant on, 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 on a reporter for the Eagle Bulletin summarizing our meeting 
for the community, that that's something that we as an organization could take control of, is here is the snapshot version of what we did at the October 10th meeting. And here's what we're planning to do next. Instead of relying on others to do those news summaries for us that may or, again, may or may not be accurate, may or may not capture the, the spirit of what we were, were doing. I just think there's a better way for us to communicate out with You know, community. one way to your point, Dan, that we can do is we have a, I'm gonna hate myself for saying this tomorrow, but we have a board's eye view column, a board's, a board's eye view column that goes out, I think it's like a couple times a year now. I certainly am willing to work with community <laughs> relations. <laughs> oh, there's gonna be a lot of help with this one <laughs> to do more of those board's eye view columns. And I definitely would need a lot of people. Look at you, Rebecca. <laughs> but I hope to do that. But I think that would be a way to get that's more. in print, right? That's in we print. We could put it on social media. We could push those out to people um, through, you know, um, um, our digital reminders to parents. We can push it out a lot of different ways. And this, it is a print um, summary, but we could do those more often and really push them out because right now we don't. They just go into the um, newsletters and that's what people see them. But if we wanted to do something more frequently, we can certainly have those more prominent on the website and more pushed out through social media. And like I said, I'm more than happy to do that with, with help. I mean, I think Nancy and Christine also write well, draft were, articles yes. that summarize the meetings. Mm -hmm. So maybe not every meeting, but there's, there's definitely some really good summaries of what was discussed at certain meetings. And maybe that just needs to be more of a focus. So if we all agree, then perhaps we do have more of a, a third goal that's communications focused, where we're having more direct communication to the public, more written communication. And that can be very smart in that we can say three times a year or four times a year, it goes into the board's eye view. And then we also say that after each meeting, our district communications department will post it on the website or, you know, those can be very measurable. But um, Marissa, you were mentioning how much extra time, and yes, it, I know it's a lot of work. It's, we're not putting it on your shoulder, but, oh, you, at you, but you tend to um, write emails to individual community members when they write to the board. But if we have this, it may save some time in not having to address each of these individually because it's already been put out there. So hopefully that eases the pressure a little bit. <laughs> You do a great job. I like you. what you said, Marissa, though, earlier that would fit what Dan is oh, saying, too. Is is just to always have some, something on the agenda, just a mm -hmm. few sentences about where we are in our goal or what's happened or what we are involved in now. It doesn't have to be lengthy. So we can um, work on the language for that as far as the communication pieces from the board. Um, what else do we want to do as far as that first one? I want to make sure I, I capture whatever we want to do as far as our continuing our work on that first goal related to DEI. I mean, I think we as a board need to understand what the administration is doing on this. And I think there's a lot of work underway. And I don't have a great, very, crystal clear sense of the action steps being taken for the audit, or I know there's been talk about that the state would ask us to come out with a um, community task force. I don't, I don't know where, could you maybe tell us where we are with that? Because I'm, I'm just thinking those are things that maybe we wanna pull out for the president's report or the superintendent's report, just to keep the community and ourselves updated on, on what's happening towards these district and board goals. Certainly we're in the awareness phase now, but we can map out in terms of community task force, in terms of you know getting community feedback on all of this as we go through. Again, not trying to get the cart out before the horse, we're still educating ourselves. You're right, some people have rushed, rushed to judgment. I mean, you never can over communicate, but some have already made up their mind as we've seen, and I just think we need to do our due diligence so that we better understand the issue. Um, I'm delighted with the speaker that's coming in in terms of a warm 
environment, an accepting environment. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, this individual's background that we have coming in is very similar to what NISCUS is bringing in for the state level uh, in March. So uh, we're, we're not far off the target in terms of starting with the four basic core principles and working our way through that. Are we waiting on more guidance from the Board of Regents on specific directives or next steps with this initiative? Uh, they may augment it. Uh, uh, I was speaking today with stewardship and I heard the state of Ohio withdrew everything. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if New York pulls back on everything, keeps moving forward and brings clarity to it. But um, we may get more guidance, we may not. So I was just looking at one of my, at my OC and BOCES updates because there was something from Superintendent Cook about a state diversity equity uh, um, commission and some work, but I can't find it at the moment. So um, as far as educating ourselves, and, and, I, and I understand what you're saying, Dr. Tice, you wanna make sure that you guys are all, I'm sorry, you, the administration is, is clear as to what the direction is from the state, but I guess for me that goal would then be um, that for each part of the framework that we're getting, that, that we are getting that information and that is part of our regular updates. Mm -hmm you know, where things stand. And, and quite frankly, if we're not getting um, direction or guidance from the state, I think we need to go back and say, we need direction and guidance to make sure we're doing this correctly. I think we can't be passive and wait for them to give us direction. I think we need to make sure we're clarifying as we go along if there are any questions. So we can certainly go back and flush that one out. I mean, I think we kind of keep that, but then add these bullet items in there about getting the information about what we're supposed to be doing as a board for each one of these steps. Um, what was the other piece? Um, next steps for the framework as far as what we're gonna be doing as a district. So maybe that's just updating and action items related to the framework. Like where should we be? Is there a time frame as to how we're supposed to carry this work out? Is there a time frame for the curriculum audit? I mean that they just told us to do a curriculum audit. Okay, when does that do? I don't I mean there's no, someone gonna there come in and look at it no. and say, you know, you did this right. I mean what I don't I don't get no. telling someone to do a curriculum audit and there's no scope to it and no um, you know, here's when it's due and here's what you need to have in it. Um, I, I may have missed this, but I know they're in the same, you have to do a curriculum audit. There's also, you should have a, a committee and we had discussed including all stakeholders. Is that something that there's no more guidance on? No no timeline, no plan in there our There are district? roadmaps that have been published and I think I've shared those with the board. I can share them again, but certainly the roadmaps will delineate things that we should be doing. But again, there's no But we timeline. don't have one for FM. There's no timeline. Yeah. Okay. Well, it seems like a lot of these details we can flush out with the DEI committee as well to kind of come up with that plan moving forward, so. Maybe at our next meeting, we can yeah. take a look at the roadmaps and start there. Okay, any other thoughts on that first goal before um, we move on? And we'll bring those back with uh, language cleaned up for the board at our next meeting. Okay, uh, where am I now? All right, so item 3. Point, uh, I believe it's 08 still. Approval of action research proposals. Is there a motion of the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District hereby approves the 2021-22 action research proposals as presented? Thank you, Kelly, and a second for Mark. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, anyone opposed or abstaining? Next, under board development, um, we had um, talked about any uh, discussion of public comment protocols. I know there was some discussion at one of our last meetings. 
Um, and there seemed to be consensus among the board of keeping it to the three minutes. Um, it seemed to work out like everybody knew their assignment today. They were very, I mean, <laughs> they were very, they stayed right under that three minutes and still got their points across. So I thought that was good. Is there any need for any further discussion about our board comment protocols? I don't think we need to tonight. Okay. We could leave it on there to parking lot. Mm -hmm. And then we'll get more information out about the retreat, working item, I'm sorry, working agenda items. Seeing nothing there. Potential considerations for future meetings. Oops, nothing there. Future meeting agendas. We do need to make the change for, or is it even on here? The mental health report, is that on here? Yeah, we need to flip need flop to that, that with and library I think we need media. To make sure we get that out to the community since there is such a big interest in it, so people are aware that that's coming up, that they can watch that particular meeting. Uh, consent agenda, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Sherry. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, so is there a motion to adjourn to executive session for the purpose of discussing two collective, collective bargaining issues and the employment history of a particular individual? Thank you, Sherry. Second from Jason. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? All right, so we're going to go in exec and have that discussion. They're going to come out very quickly for a public session to, um, for personnel. And uh, what was one more? Oh, and then to approve the um, revised welcome statement. So that's what we'll come out for a public session for. All right, so we're going to move into executive session. Thank you to those of you who hung in with us till the end. Are you writing to yourself? <laughs> Will I write into myself? <laughs> you don't know what I'm writing? No, I, I see. No.
Check, check. Can you hear me now? Check, check, check. Check. Jack.